All right. Um, thanks everyone for for joining in to the uh, the master class one uh, innovation in biomimetic materials, our nanotechnologies master class session uh, as part of the UT Austin Portugal program. Um, so uh, I'm going to be one of the moderators. I'm Brian Corgel, uh, professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, also moderating will be uh, Paolo Ferreira, who's uh, one of the uh, area directors of nanotechnologies in Portugal for the UT Austin Portugal program. Um, Paolo is a uh, head of Department of Advanced Electron Microscopy, Imaging, and Spectroscopy at the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory, and also a full professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering at IST, University of Lisbon. Um, so also directing one of the area directors in Portugal uh, who will be uh, joining us and, and uh, probably could help answer some questions if needed is Carla Silva. So she's uh, also an area director of nanotechnologies in Portugal as part of the UT Austin Portugal program. She's the director of the Department of Chemistry and Biotechnology at the Technical Center for the Textile and Clothing Industry of Portugal, uh, CTEV. So uh, I'm one of the area directors in nanotechnology as part of the UT Austin Portugal program. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know much about the program, uh, it's a program between UT Austin and, and Portugal. Um, there, there are a few different program areas and one is focused on nanotechnologies. So the nanotechnologies program is uh, there to establish new research and innovation agendas involving complex materials, engineering and science, focused on an integrative approach to nanoscience over diverse uh, applications. So uh, we've got several partner institutions uh, within Portugal, uh, including the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory, INL. Uh, at UT Austin, we have, uh, as one of the primary partners, the, uh, our National Science Foundation funded Materials Research Science and Engineering Center for Dynamics and Control of Materials. So um, our master class is, is uh, going to focus on biomimetic materials this year. So this is a, a really interesting research area related to nanotechnologies. We've got uh, some really great speakers um, today lined up to talk about some of their work from uh, both uh, the United States and in Austin, Texas, and also uh, in Portugal. So um, biomimetic materials are designed to replicate one or more attributes of a material produced by a living organism. And there are numerous examples of functional surfaces, fibrous structures, structural colors, highly catalytic, self-cleaning, self-healing, thermal insulation materials, among other others, which offer important lessons for the materials of the future. So um, this session will focus on some of those materials with the work specifically in uh, the researchers groups that, that um, we've invited to, to give a talk. And um, please feel free to, answer, uh, to ask any questions that you might have. So there's a Q&A um, login. We'll have 30 minutes for the talks from our speakers and then 10 minutes available for questions and answers. So just as you have a, a question, feel free to enter it into the Q&A box. And then uh, during the Q&A session, we'll go ahead and, and present those to the speakers and they will, they will answer those. So we're really looking forward to the, um, the session this morning. Uh, questions are, are certainly welcome. We're looking forward to a really interesting session. Um, from University of Texas at Austin, our, our first speaker is uh, Professor Keith Kites. So uh, Keith is an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he did his PhD at Caltech with Bob Grubbs. Um, we're really uh, happy to have him on our faculty uh, at UT Austin. And he's doing some really interesting work um, at this intersection between uh, chemical synthesis and polymers making and utilizing living systems to induce uh, new kinds of chemistry, new kinds of properties in the materials. 
So his research is focused on chemical and biological synthesis of functional materials combined with mechanistic studies and the development of structure property uh, relationships. So it's a pleasure to have Keith here and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Keith to um, take it away. Thank you, Brian, uh, for the introduction, and uh, thank you for the invitation to speak here. Um, good morning, I guess, slash good afternoon to everybody. Um, let me just go ahead and share my screen and get the presentation started. Um, so, Brian, can you, uh, I guess, confirm that you can see the slides and hear me? Yep, yeah, looks great. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, so again, my name is Keith Kites. I'm an assistant professor in chemical engineering at UT Austin. And today I'm going to talk about how we can control uh, material properties using a microbial respiration process that's known as extracellular electron transfer. Um, so what is extracellular electron transfer? The best way to think about it is to start from um, what we do kind of when we're breathing. So um, if you just had lunch, if you just had a snack or you just had breakfast like I did or some coffee, your in intake is some sort of carbon source. So sugar, carbohydrates, something like that. And ultimately we're oxidizing that carbon to CO2 or our cells are oxidizing it to CO2. So that process generates electrons and we have to get rid of those electrons somehow. And so we use oxygen as a terminal electron acceptor for that process. And of course, many organisms um, on earth do the same thing, including bacteria. Um, but there are also many environments on earth, um, such as uh, in the soil, in the um, deep ocean or marine environments in our bodies that are anaerobic, where oxygen is not available as an electron acceptor. And so what you do in this case is you have a couple different options. So you can you could use fermentation, for example, so kind of endogenous electron acceptors. You could use um, alternative electron acceptors, things like sulfates or phosphates or nitrates. But some bacteria have this special ability to use metals as terminal electron acceptors. So specifically soluble metals such as iron-3 or manganese-4, as well as oxides composed of uh, those metals as well that are naturally present in the environment. And so the basic process is, is illustrated in this cartoon on the left, where again, we're oxidizing carbon to CO2. Electrons are generated from that oxidation process. And they essentially go through two insulating membranes through a special set of proteins that are acting as a molecular wire. And then eventually those electrons exit the cell and reduce a uh, metal species that's outside of the cell. So this process ends up being pretty important for a number of reasons. Um, first is in uh, biological geochemistry, where these organisms participate in the reduction of iron in the biosphere. And the reason that's important is because iron is a very hot commodity, both within our bodies as well as the environment, but it's typically locked away as an insoluble oxide. And so if you're an organism that can reduce, say, iron-3 to iron-2, you free up that iron to kind of move through that, the biosphere. And that connects um, sort of the iron cycle, the global iron cycle, with the global nitrogen cycle, the global carbon cycle, so for things like nitrogen fixation, carbon reduction, et cetera. And this is really where the study of organisms capable of extracellular electron transfer got its start, is in the, the biogeochemistry community. You can also directly harvest uh, electricity or current that's being produced um, by these organisms in what's called a bioelectrochemical or microbial fuel cell. So the idea here is now you're oxidizing some carbon source or the bacteria are oxidizing that carbon source and they're essentially electro electronically connected to the electrode. And so those electrons are going through the electrode, they're doing work and you can harvest that power for small devices. More recently, it's been found that um, EET may be an important process in anaerobic environments um, within our bodies, such as the gut. And so we know that some pathogens have um, this capability. And so what that can do is give a pathogen a so-called selection advantage over commensal uh, organisms or our natural gut microbiota or other pathogens that may be present um, in our digestive system. And so the idea is here, here is if you can use iron, say, as an electron acceptor and other organisms can't, then you can grow at their expense, essentially. So the way we like to think of ET is really a fundamental mechanism, electronic mechanism that microbes use to influence and control the redox behavior of their environment. And so this is just a sampling of some organisms, um, mostly over here, kind of on the right-hand side that have uh, this capability. So both gram-negative and gram-positive bacteria exhibit EET activity, and it usually tracks with the number of cytochrome encoding genes. So cytochromes are special electron transfer proteins that I'll talk a little bit more about in a second. Um, so the two kind of main players as far as sort of poster children for EET-based 
EET-based bacteria are uh, the Geobacter genus, which is shown here. These are obligate anaerobes, so basically they can they can only use, or sorry, they cannot use oxygen as an electron acceptor. Oxygen is actually toxic for them. And then Schuonella uh, onidensis, which is uh, very similar actually to E. coli in some respect. It's a facultative anaerobe, which means it can use oxygen as well as different metals as electron acceptors. Uh, so my lab focuses mostly on Schuonella onidensis, uh, the wild type of which is known as MR1, that's the strain designation. And the nice thing about Schuonella is it's really a model organism for studying and applying ET, and there's a number of reasons for that. Um, the first is the diversity of respiratory substrates that it can use. So like I mentioned, it, it's similar to E. coli, it can use oxygen as an electron acceptor, so it's very easy to grow in the lab. It grows at about the same rate as, as uh, E. coli, for example. It can also use uh, organics like uh, trimethylamine uh, in oxide, so TMAO or DMSO as electron acceptors. But what we're most interested in is its ability to use a wide range of different metal species um, as terminal electron acceptors for its respiratory pathways. So these include things like iron or copper, cobalt, manganese, vanadium, gold, palladium, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of different transition metals that lie within its, its redox range um, and essentially that it can reduce. And it can also interact with materials that are composed of these metals as well, or sorry, insoluble materials that are composed of these materials as well. Uh, one of the other nice things is that it has a pretty well understood electron transfer pathway. And the sort of key pathway I'm going to be talking about today is this so-called MTR metal reduction pathway. And the way to think about this is essentially just as a wire that is sticking out of the cell, kind of shooting electrons out all over the place. Um, so it's composed of three proteins, MTRC, MTRA, and MTRB. And like I said, the purpose of these is to span the, the sort of insulating layer that is comprised of the outer membrane and allow for electronic communication between the periplasm and the extracellular space. Uh, finally, we're interested in synthetic biology and genetic engineering applications. So we want an organism to be so-called genetically tractable so we can make knockouts, we can insert exogenous DNA, and Schuonella can do all of those things um, pretty readily. So this is um, kind of the underlying theme or hypothesis that connects a lot of the work in my lab. Um, so one of the unique things about electron transfer is if you think about um, the way that your phone or your computer or any sort of modern computing architecture operates, when we talk about moving electrons around, we're not just talking about moving electrons, but we're also talking about transmitting information. And so kind of transitioning that idea to thinking about a living system, we can think about these electron transfer pathways, again, these wires that sort of sit on the outer membrane of the cell, acting almost as a universal serial bus or connector that connects internal computations within the cell. So these could be sort of natural computations. The cell is sensing a new environment, a change in pH, a change in salinity, or a change in temperature. Or they can be programmed things like using CRISPR-Cas9 or promoter engineering or different types of RNA circuits. Um, so all of that internal computation is connected to the extracellular space up here through this electron transfer pathway in the middle. And so then you can envision a number of different outputs for the electrons that are coming from these bacteria. So I mentioned power generation as one of those, but there's a lot of different other chemical and physical transformations that can be driven using electrons. So this includes things like material synthesis, such as nanoparticle formation, for example, um, cellular communication. So cells also communicate electronically using these um, electron transfer pathways, uh, sensing and also catalysis as well. So we really like to think of ET as a universal means of connecting sort of genetic or proteomic or metabolic logic within the cell to control different types of biological and chemical systems that are outside of the cell. And so here are three sort of representative project areas that we have going on in my lab right now. Um, so on the left-hand side, we have a, a research area that's focused really on synthetic biology and genetic engineering applications of Schuonella onidensis. So really asking can you control, uh, turn on and off electron flux in a programmable manner um, using genetic engineering toolkits? Uh, the next topic that I'm going to focus on today is um, what we're calling microbial redox catalysis. So the analogy here is to electrocatalysis, where you have a potentiostat that's supplying electrons or removing electrons, excuse me, from an electro from a catalyst, and that's turning over some reaction. So the idea is here to just replace that electrode with these bacteria, and can you do essentially the same types of catalysis? Uh, and then finally, we also, I'm not going to talk about it today, but we're also interested in biological handles for tuning um, nanoparticle or inorganic material production. So again, tuning the flux of these EET pathways and using that to control nanoparticle deposition, size, morphology, these sorts of things. And so I'm going to focus on this uh, catalysis and we'll get to the materials here in a second. I know it's supposed to be a materials talk. 
Uh, and so primarily what I'm going to be talking about today are the synthesis of soft materials um, using this electron transfer interface. So one of the initial reactions that we wanted to focus on was a type of controlled radical polymerization known as atom transfer radical polymerization. So the diagram is a little bit complicated, but the main takeaway here is we start with a reduced metal catalyst that is going to react with a bromidated species or a bromidated initiator, and that generates an active radical, which is then free to add additional monomers to extend our polymer chain. So the key um, sort of innovation for this polymerization is that this uh, uh, equilibrium, this reaction is in equilibrium between the reduced and the oxidized metal species. So it's constantly going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And consequently, this radical is constantly being shut off, essentially. So it's entering a dormant versus an active state, more or less constantly. The key is that it's most often in a dormant state. And why that's important is because it prevents the radicals from doing unwanted kind of reactions like early termination or recombination, things like this. And so we have a really low active concentration of radicals in solution at any given time. So it was known from the Matyshevsky group who really pioneered um, this polymer synthesis methodology that you could actually control the rate of this polymerization by supplying a um, exogenous redox potential. So if you have an electrode or potentiostat um, kind of in your system, you can bias this equilibrium between the reduced catalyst and the oxidized catalyst one way or the other, and you can therefore control the rate of the polymerization. So the idea, initial idea was, well, can you um, remove the electrode and just ask bacteria to do the same thing? So the chemistry is exactly the same over here on the right. Now we're just taking a carbon source, in this case lactate, feeding it to bacteria. They generate electron flux, and we essentially capture part of that electron flux and use it to power this polymerization. So this was the question we were interested in asking, at least as a proof of principle. And so here's a slide detailing kind of the logistics of how the experiments are actually run. So we first plate the bacteria, nothing unusual there, pick colonies, grow them up in an anaerobic culture. So we're just growing them on lactate and fumarate, which acts as a secondary electron acceptor. And then we take an aliquot essentially of that anaerobic culture and add it to a new mixture that contains our monomer, which in this case is a pegylated methacrylate. So pretty common water soluble um, monomer that can undergo radical polymerization. We have an initiator, which again is this bromidated species. This is where the radical is going to start, uh, be first generated, and then a catalyst, which I'll talk about more in a second. So we put the bacteria in, uh, and then um, and then we let it go, <laughs> and then hopefully form a polymer. So because we're running a synthetic polymerization, we're interested in a couple things here. One is the polymerization rate. So we want it to be first order. Um, so that's a good indication that we have control over the radical polymer radical population, radical concentration, and solution. We also want molecular weight control so we can predict what the theoretical molecular weight of the polymer is based on our monomer to initiator ratio. And so we want our experimental molecular weight to be as close to that as possible. And then all synthetic polymers have a polydispersity, so they're never exactly the same molecular weight, but we want the distribution of molecular weights to be as close to unity or close to one as possible. Again, these are all indications that you have a well-controlled polymerization. Okay, so this was the first um, kind of data that we were looking at. Um, so first thing to point out over here, we're we'll focusing on the plot on the left, is we're looking at the log of monomer consumption over time, and we can see that we get lines, so that's good. So that's a good indication that we have first order um, behavior in the polymerization. Uh, other thing to point out here is the difference between the black and the red and the blue lines. So the black line is Schuonella wild type MR1 with media that contains a bunch of different metals in it. Okay, so it has molybdenum, it has copper, it has iron, it's a pretty common mixture for culturing Schuonella and other extremophiles or other bacteria, and it's sort of a witch's brew, so to speak. So there's lots of different potentially catalytically active metals in there, and we get a rate um, that corresponds to this. Now, we knew from the literature that copper, it, the copper 2-1 redox couple is a very well-known um, catalyst for ATRP for this type of polymerization. So the question, first question was, if you remove all of the metals from that microbial media, except for copper, what happens? And that's this red trace right here. So you can see if you just add copper in back at the same concentration as it was before in the black case, but no other metals around, you get approximately the same rate. Uh, and then finally, if you do the same reaction, but now you use a non-electroactive organism, so a control essentially, that's E. coli in this case, you see very little activity over time, which is the blue kind of down here. So right away, we know that there's something special about having copper in the system, as well as ha having Schuonella onidensis in the system that gives us good polymerization activity. Uh, furthermore, we know 
based on the mechanism of this reaction that we have to have reduction of copper two to copper one in order to get polymerization. So we wanted to independently confirm that was happening outside of the polymerization. So we use a special type of fluorescent dye that uh, was developed by Chris Chang's group at UC Berkeley that turns on its fluorescence in the presence of copper one. And so this allows us to uh, characterize the extracellular concentration of copper one in real time using fluorescence. And that's the data that's shown here on the right. So we're incubating uh, either MR1, Schoenella, or E. coli uh, with copper two, and then looking for uh, this turn on in fluorescence. And right away with MR1, we get an increase in fluorescence, uh, an increase in copper one that um, persist for a number of hours. And then eventually E. coli is also able to reduce a small amount of copper as well, but significantly different than what Schuonella is able to do. So again, this is mechanistically consistent with our hypothesis that Schuonella is reducing copper two to copper one, that is kickstarting the polymerization, and then we get these controlled first order kinetics. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about the actual properties of the polymers that we form with Schuonella. So the rate of the reaction is actually fairly similar to the rate that you would get um, if you were running the reaction completely synthetically with a, with a chemical reductant such as sodium ascorbate. Uh, one of the other properties we're interested in is, like I said, control of molecular weight. And typically with a uh, living polymerization, we want there to be a linear relationship between molecular weight, which is over here on the left, and the conversion of the reaction. So essentially, we should be able to predict what the molecular weight should be based on how much monomer has been converted. And you see that in the black here, that we do get that, indeed get that linear relationship. Um, over here in the purple, corresponding to the right-hand axis, is the polydispersity index, excuse me, or PDI. Again, we want this to be as close to one as possible, and we're getting in about that ballpark. So they, these numbers are pretty consistent, again, with what you would expect from a this sort of completely chemical or synthetic version of this polymerization. So at least from a chemistry standpoint, this polymerization seems to be operating as we expect. Uh, and additionally, they exhibit living characteristics that we associate with ATRP. Again, just to summarize, a linear relationship between molecular weight and conversion and low PDIs. Um, this isn't really, there isn't really anything quantitative to extract from these scanning electron micrograph micrographs, but we can we can physically see what's happening during the polymerization. So this is before the polymerization. You can see bacteria hanging out, just doing their thing on a surface. And then after the bacteria, after the polymerization, they're covered in this sort of gunk, um, so to speak. Okay, so that was all fine and good. Um, so we know we can make polymer, we can characterize the polymer. It looks like a living polymerization, but really what we were interested in is how closely is the polymerization tied to the biological, the metabolism, or these electron transfer proteins in the system. So essentially, how much biological control do we have over the polymerization? So the first thing we wanted to look at was the central carbon metabolism of Schuonella. Kind of a simplified cartoon is shown here. The main takeaway here is Schuonella generates different amounts of electron flux depending on what it's eating. So if it has lactate, you can see in this cartoon, basically you get four equivalents of electron, four electron equivalents per, let's say, mole of lactate that the bacteria eat. But if you start with something pyruvate, you start with something like pyruvate, you've sort of shut off this previous pathway. So you only get two electrons. Uh, if you feed acetate, the cells are effectively starving under anaerobic conditions because they can't digest it. And then in addition to carbon source, we also wanted to look at the role of, a, of like I mentioned, these special electron transfer proteins. And so um, indeed, you, when you uh, feed the bacteria different uh, carbon sources, so lactate is in black, pyruvate is in purple, acetate, uh, is in red and starved cells are in gray, you do see significant differences in terms of the rate of polymerization. So this is an early indication that we can control uh, the properties of the polymerization, specifically polymerization rate, just based on what the bacteria are eating. Um, what we were more excited about was the ability to have a genetic or proteomic handle for controlling polymerization. So we wanted to look at what is the role of these specific EET pathways in controlling uh, polymerization rate. So all bacteria change their redox, change their extracellular redox environment, and Schuonella has a number of pretty powerful reducing agents besides the MTR pathway that it can kind of secrete from the cell. So one of those is hydrogen, for example. Um, it can also shoot out soluble redox shuttles known as flavins um, that can also reduce species at a distance. And so we wanted to kind of interrogate what the role of each of these reducing species was using genetic knockouts. So that's what we're starting with over here on the left. So the black is the wild type. Uh, the blue is a double hydrogenase knockout. The green is a flavin knockout, so we have uh, partially eliminated the ability of the cells to export flavins into the extracellular environment. And then finally, the gray is a knockout of this MTRC OMCA pathway, okay? So essentially, you can imagine the gray as if we're snipping an electronic wire 
that's connecting the cell to the catalyst. So we don't see any difference really between MR1 and the hydrogenase knockouts and BFE. So that's the black, green, and blue curves. But when we knock out this MTRC pathway, we see a significant attenuation in the, in the polymerization rate. And this is consistent with our previous results looking at E. coli, because one of the key differences between Schuonella and E. coli is E. coli does not have a homologous pathway to this one shown right here. Furthermore, we can do what's called a complementation assay, where essentially we take that same knockout and we add in exogenous DNA that encodes the MTRC protein or gene. Uh, and so that's what we're looking at in this experiment over on the right. So the black is, again, our uh, wild type bacteria with an empty vector control. Our gray is the knockout with an empty vector control. And then you can see when we add in MTRC, that gene, we get a partial rescue of polymerization activity. So these are all good indications that the MTR pathway is playing a role in polymerization. And specifically, this MTRC seems to be a critical reg regulator of polymerization rate. So I haven't really talked about why this is actually useful. Um, so that's sort of what we wanted to focus on next. Um, so the next thing we decided to do was take advantage really of the facultative nature of Schuonella and its ability to use multiple different electron acceptors, um, not simultaneously, but in sequence. And so in particular, we wanted to look at, uh, ask the question, could we run aerobic polymerizations using Schuonella? The reason that this is challenging is because all radical reactions uh, can be quenched by oxygen. So typically if you've run one of these polymerizations um, in your lab, you probably had to do it in a glove box or use Schlink technique, get rid of the oxygen somehow. And so we wanted to see, can Schuonella essentially scrub oxygen from the system, then turn on the polymerization via these EET pathways? Um, and I guess long story short, that works. Um, so you can run these polymerizations just in an open container on the bench top, just after the, adding the bacteria to the polymerization mixture, and it works pretty well. You can see over here on the left, we have um, controls looking at if you have metal, if you don't have metal, if you have bacteria, if you don't have bacteria, if you have supernatant. And really the only time that you get good activity is when you have all the polymerization components plus uh, MR1 or Schuonella in this case. So this is with catalyst, with monomer, with initiator, and with uh, Schuonella, and you get good activity. Uh, about almost quantitative conversion after a couple hours. Um, one of the other things that's interesting about aerobic polymerizations is they eliminate a lot of the problems that we had uh, for uh, with regard to control experiments. So one of the things we were really concerned about in the beginning under anaerobic conditions is lysed cells. So when a cell blows up, it can essentially release a lot of reductants, uh, different reducing metal ions, glutathione, hydrogen, other powerful reductants into solution. And that can turn on the polymerization as well. So the nice thing about aerobic conditions is that it really eliminates that process because even if the cells are lysing, there's no active mechanism to scrub oxygen from the system. So if you have any adventitious reduction, it's immediately oxidized again by oxygen, oxygen, excuse me, if you have radicals that form, they're immediately quenched by oxygen. Um, so this is just a nice kind of handle for us because it makes the polymerization a little bit more controlled. Uh, we can also look at polymerization rate um, and see that it's a function of the inoculating cell density. So the more cells that we have, the faster the polymerization goes up to a certain point. So again, this is a good indication that we have cellular control over these processes. Um, one of the cool things we can do is run this as if you were running a fermentation. So you can take lyophilized cells or freeze-dried cells, and you can just add them to the polymerization mixture. So you don't need to do any microbial culture. You can just add the cells as a powder, and then magically you get kind of polymer that forms. And then just like a fermentation, you can collect the spent cells after the polymerization and then recycle them, put them in another polymerization mixture, and kind of get polymer to come out. And these uh, graphs in the middle and the right are just showing that the polymerization works as you would expect it to using either lyophilized or spent cells. Okay, so the summary from the polymerization part is that we can use EET to power a controlled radical polymerization. Uh, polymerization is tolerant to oxygen exposure. We can also use it with a variety of different metals. And then of course the polymers have controlled molecular weight, low poly dispersities, and both of these are characteristic of this specific polymerization mechanism. So we don't have a ton of time left, I don't think, uh, but what I want to focus on uh, for the, the uh, sort of a few slides here is a collaboration we actually have with Professor Adrian Rosales, who's the next speaker, focusing on extending this polymerization to hydrogel formation. So the polymerization mechanism exa is exactly the same. We're just using it to cross-link an existing polymer now instead of forming homopolymer. So we chose to look at this methacrylated, uh, uh, methacrylated hyaluronic acid um, derivative, which is a common tissue engineering scaffold. 
And we can see right away just in these pictures that if we have E. coli, we get no gel formation. So you have a meniscus, you have liquid flowing. When you have Schuonella, you get gel formation kind of in this little um, centrifuge tube here. And so we're interested in looking at the properties of these gels more quantitatively using um, rheology. And so what we're looking at on the y-axis here is G prime, where the storage modulus or stiffness of the gel. Again, we can see similar to our previous polymerization controls that uh, it's only really when we have an electroactive bacteria, MR1, initiator, and catalyst that we get strong gels. And I should mention that these gels, in terms of mechanical properties, are very similar to what you would get if you were just using a traditional kind of photoradical generator, uh, which is one of the more common ways to form uh, these types of gels. Um, again, we, we can play all the same sort of chemistry games that um, other people play in hydrogel synthesis. So if we adjust the initiator, we can change the storage modulus. If we adjust or sorry, if we adjust the catalyst concentration, I should say in this case, if we adjust the initiator, we can also dial in specific moduli. And so we know the more storage modules of the gel depends on the catalyst, the bacteria, and the initiator concentration. Just like, again, with the polymerization, we can see that we get a dependence on the initial optical density or the initial population of the cells. So the more cells, the faster the cross-linking and the stronger the, the gel. Um, one of the uh, cool things we can do in addition to these endpoint measurements is look at, excuse me, the uh, cross-linking in real time. So here we're using uh, rheology in real time to monitor the stiffness over time. And you can see, again, when we have higher ODs, that's over here on the left, we get faster cross-linking, stiffer gels. As we move to lower ODs, we still get gels, uh, but they form a little bit slower and they're a little bit weaker, at least on these time scales. Okay. So again, we are interested in biological control. Um, so basically, can we identify a genetic handle that allows us to control on the genetic level or proteomic level, the properties of these gels? Now, so uh, what we're looking at here over the, on the left is again, the wild type MR1 in, in black. And then we're looking at more sort of progressive knockouts of this electron transfer machinery. So we're essentially snipping more and more wires is the way to think about it. And we get the behavior that we expect. Essentially, as we reduce electronic communication between the bacteria and the catalyst, we see a corresponding reduction in um, both the cross-linking rate as well as the overall modulus of the gels that we're forming. This panel in the middle is showing the exact same thing. It's just a different type of experiment um, where we're collecting the gels after they've been formed and then measuring them on the rheometer. And um, again, this is just confirming that the, the data that we see before is not a, an artifact of kind of doing things in situ on the rheometer. Um, one of the cool things is that we can, um, these sort of the modulus controls cell motility within the gel. So very stiff gels, it's, it's difficult or impossible for the bacteria to move. And so we can actually, using microscopy, measure the motility of the cells over time during this cross-linking reaction. What we find is that with MR1, the black trace here, essentially as soon as we add the bacteria, they start to get stuck within the gel or within the matrix. Whereas these knockouts, because they uh, execute this cross-linking reaction slower, they don't get stuck quite as quickly. Okay, so last part here is we wanted to sort of dial in and um, on this genetic control over hydrogel formation and ask sort of the next step, can we move beyond knockouts and control the modulus using a expression vector where we regulate uh, quite tightly the expression of this electron transfer protein or gene MTRC. So the hypothesis here is that, is that if we have low expression, um, gene expression, then we have a weak gel. If we have high expression, we have a strong gel. And the way that we control expression in this case is by adding a small molecule, IPTG, which relieves repression of this promoter and then causes the gene to turn on. So the more of this small molecule add, the more the gene turns on, the less small molecule, the less it turns on. Um, and so what we're looking at over here on the left is just the circuit designed to express GFP. And we get this characteristic uh, sort of transcriptional response that's known as a Hill function. So again, at low IPTG concentrations over here on the left, we have very low fluorescence or very minimal fluorescence. At high concentrations, we start to see fluorescence turn on and we get this sort of sinusoidal type behavior. And what's interesting is that when we swap the gene uh, out, so we basically switch GFP for MTRC, now we're no longer looking at fluorescence, we're actually looking at the mechanical properties of the gel that we measure, we still get the same behavior, okay? So again, at low IPTG, we get weak gels or no gels. At high IPTG, so high expression of MTRC, we get uh, strong gels or relatively strong gels relative compared to the wild type. So essentially, if you plot this left and middle plot together, 
you get a linear relationship. So this is important for us because it essentially allows us to predict um, what a specific genetic circuit is going to do in terms of affecting gelation. Um, so most genetic circuits are characterized and designed to express GFP. So we can take those existing genetic circuits and now we can essentially have a transfer function that tells us how that circuit is going to behave in the context of our gelation system. And so this is just data showing that it's not a kind of one-off experiment. So we're looking at different methacrylate concentrations in our hyaluronic acid here. And we see we get the same behavior, um, different overall moduli. So a thousand here, you know, 3000 here, about 3000 here. So the, the overall magnitude of the gel is not changing, but the relationship of the gel stiffness to our IPTG concentration is only dependent on this genetic circuit. And perhaps an easier way to visualize this is um, but by plotting all of these uh, versus relative expression units, and again, we get this linear relationship where, in theory, we can predict how the gel will behave based on the previous performance of a genetic circuit using its fluorescence output. Okay, so the reason that we're really excited about this, um, it's still early days, but having genetic control over radical cross-linking, uh, we think, has a variety of, of potential applications. So in, in terms of responsive materials, so we can essentially connect this cellular computation to a macroscopic change in a material, in this case, a soul gel transition. Can also envision kind of more complicated things like device fabrication or wound repair, looking at developmental biology hypothesis, because again, this is a cellular genetic controlled sort of manipulation of a material, which is something similar that happens in embryo development, happens in developmental biology. It's much more complicated, but we have a sort of synthetic system um, that replicates many aspects of those, of those different fields. Um, imagining hierarchical materials, so like I mentioned at the beginning, not only can we form soft materials, but we can actually make hard materials uh, like nanoparticles. So you can imagine using these same electron transfer pathways for forming a, um, a essentially a synthetic extracellular matrix and then forming kind of inorganic nanoparticles or other inorganic species within that matrix. Um, perhaps the most realistic in the near term is things like 3D printing. So photo cross-linking is a very popular method for um, stereolithographic 3D printing, and so we can have sort of a genetic handle for controlling the properties of 3D printed materials that undergo radical cross-linking. And so with that, I'd just like to conclude and talk about, um, just sort of summarize a little bit of the work and give some future outlook and say that one of the things we, you know, we use Shunella onidensis, but there's a lot of organisms that are EET capable, and so we're excited to extend a lot of these polymerization and gelation systems to other organisms that have similar metabolic capability. Um, EET allows organisms to interact with multiple metals uh, and materials. So we've primarily looked at things like iron and copper, but there's a huge range of different metals that Shunella can interact with um, in, a, in an electron transfer manner. And then finally, EET proteins, so MTRC, MTRA, uh, these proteins that are really important in this electron transfer pathway really facilitate information transfer between biological and abiotic systems. And so with that, I'd like to thank the graduate students and postdocs, in particular, Dr. Chris Dundas, Dr. Gong Fan, and Austin Graham, who did most of this work, uh, and our funding sources, um, NSF, the Air Force Office of Scientific Research, the NIH, and the Welch Foundation. And finally, I'd like to thank you again, um, Brian and the UT Austin Portugal program for the invitation and everybody for their attention, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Great, thanks, Keith. That that was great. Um, so we we've already got uh, one question in the in the Q and A. So uh, from Carla Silva. So in your opinion, can EET slash MR one approach be used to produce polymers with industrial application like food, plastic, or textile industries? Uh, let me see if I have a. Sorry, my. Uh presentation I think is frozen somehow. Um, just give me one second here. Or my whole computer is frozen. <laughs> <laughs> I can't click on anything, but I can still talk apparently. So I'm not sure what exactly is going on. Uh, but um, I, I don't have this, unfortunately can't move to the slide now apparently, but oh wait, maybe, okay, here we go. Okay, exactly. Uh, so, so it's a great question. Um, so we've primarily been looking at these water soluble monomers so far, just as a proof of principle, but we did dip our toe into looking at, you know, more industrial rev relevant polymers like polystyrene, PMMA, um, polynipam, et cetera. And we can get those to work to a certain extent. We haven't optimized them. Um, one of the big challenges, at least with more industrial polymers like uh, 
polymethyl methacrylate, polystyrene, et cetera, is that they are, are not water soluble. Um, and so putting them into an aqueous system is difficult. And, and additionally, in the case of styrene, they can exhibit some toxicity. So when we put them in our system, we do get some polymer that comes out on the other side. And it's something that we, we're, we're trying to optimize currently. So we do think that we can access those sort of more industrial polymers in the future. Um, it's just something we're working towards right now. So the proof of principle looks good, um, but there are a lot of challenges associated with it. Great question. Yeah, um, I, I have a question for you. So, so Keith, in terms of the chemistry, um, what are some of the advantages that this biological approach brings over sort of typical industrial chemical approaches to the polymerization? So let me go back. Sorry, I have to use my arrows to do this. Um, so this is, at least for the polymerization, this is the biggest advantage we've found so far is you get this scrubbing mechanism where normally you would have to run these types of polymerizations under completely anaerobic conditions, which from a scale-up perspective can be a little bit challenging because you need to remove oxygen from the system. Um, so one advantage is basically, you know, if you imagine making wine or brewing beer, you can envision maybe something similar with polymer synthesis where basically you just throw the bacteria into your mixture, they grow and eventually consume all the oxygen and then they sort of automatically recognize that oxygen is depleted and then they turn on the polymerization. And so in theory, you could turn fermenters and other types of very, very simple types of reactors into, into polymerization reactors, um, but still get you know, a controlled radical polymerization out the other end. Um, there are some more kind of practical advantages, such as we can we can use very low catalyst um, loadings, which is uh, so copper concentrations in this case. So that's a problem that's kind of plagued ATRP for a long time, is you have to use usually high micromolar, millimolar concentrations of the copper in order to get control. And so we're at PPM levels of um, copper in this case, and so the amount of metal contamination we get is is very low. Um, and, and sort of beyond that, we get polymerization rates that are competitive with, you know, sort of the best synthetic systems that are out there right now. So we think that there's still a lot of work to go. Um, we don't completely understand all the mechanics of how the polymerization is, op is, is operating, but we think those are the, the primary advantages relative to more traditional uh, polymer synthesis methodologies. Great. Um, well, we have time for one more question if anybody has one. Well, you can enter it into the Q and A uh, box there. Okay. Well, if not, um, thanks a lot, Keith. That was really, really informative talk. Um, really enjoyed it, and uh, thanks again for for taking the time th this morning and this afternoon Portugal time. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Brian. Uh, Andre, you may have to kick me off the screen share because I'm clicking stop share, and. Nothing is happening. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, can you all still see me? Um, I still see your screen. Um, OK. I'm going to, I think Andre could hear you. Um, Okay, hold on. Okay. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Got it. All right, cool. Okay, so uh, excellent. So our our next talk is coming uh, again from from UT Austin. So uh, from uh, Adrian Rosales. So she's going to talk about engineering functional hydrogels from biomimetic polymers. So Adrian is a, an assistant professor in the Department of Chemical Engineering at the University of Texas at Austin. And her research group, the Rosales Research Group, studies and develops dynamic polymer systems to engineer complex biological microenvironments. So uh, we're looking forward to the talk from, from Adrian. And uh, same thing, as you have questions, feel free to enter them in the Q&A box and then uh, Adrian will answer them at, at the end, and um, we're looking forward to your talk. Thanks, Adrian. Hi, yes, thanks so much. Um, could one of the hosts please turn on my video? It says that I'm not able to do it because the host has stopped it.
Okay, great. All right, well, thank you very much for the introduction, Brian, and um, thank you to all of the hosts for the invitation to be here. I'm really excited to share some of my group's work on engineering functional hydrogels from biomimetic polymers. And I think Keith gave a great introduction to a little bit of, um, of hydrogels. And so I hope to expand on that specifically uh, with an eye towards what my group is interested in. So, let me... all right, so we're broadly interested in hydrogels as engineered extracellular matrices. Uh, my group is really interested in the interplay between mammalian cells and their surrounding natural material niche. And in particular, uh, we think of different ways to capture aspects of that extracellular matrix, um, particularly for to replicate certain disease states or uh, different tissues of the body during instances of development. And a few applications where that is um, particularly relevant include tissue engineering scaffolds. So it's widely known that hydrogels have mechanical properties and some uh, sometimes chemical properties as well that mimic those of soft tissues in the body. And so they're a really great platform for culturing cells in vitro, as well as introducing specific cues to direct cell differentiation uh, on the bench. In addition, these are great platforms for replicating disease environments in vitro as well. And so we can add in different cues um, as well as different architectures to mimic disease states outside of the body. And that's helpful um, as drug screening platforms in addition to potentially avoiding the need for uh, numerous animal studies. So the more complex that we can make our in vitro disease models, uh, hopefully the better accuracy we can predict cell behavior with. Uh, recently, hydrogels have emerged as interesting platforms for cell delivery of vehicles. So because um, of different types of chemistries that we can incorporate into the hydrogel crosslinking, uh, sometimes they can be extruded through a syringe and needle, uh, allowing for uh, a vehicle that can essentially protect cells from the mechanical forces of shear during injection and thereby increasing post-injection cell viability. Uh, and to put this in a little bit of context, uh, some stem cell therapies only get you know, anywhere between one and maybe 30% uh, live cells post-injection. So that necessitates the need for a lot of um, therapeutic cells to achieve a desired function. Uh, and really bringing down the cost of those therapies would be enhanced by increasing post-injection viability, as well as increasing local retention of those cells. And hydrogels are one promising way to do that. And then finally, uh, because hydrogels can be extruded, they can also sometimes be extruded through things like liquid handling platforms, allowing uh, for the creation of these high throughput screening platforms, for example, in a 96 volt plate, and again, enabling rapid identification and investigation of cell behavior in a multitude of conditions. So um, we, we think this could be very exciting for screening pharmaceutics in a more biologically relevant environment. So for all of these reasons, um, hydrogels are, are very attractive as a platform in many applications in biotechnology and bioengineering. And uh, in particular, there are a few key features that I'd like to highlight in biological extracellular matrices that we're hoping to capture with synthetic matrices. So here I'm just showing a schematic of um, a biological ECM. We know that these are heterogeneous uh, types of materials. So they're typically formed uh, from fibrillar proteins such as your collagens, your elastins, your laminins. And the composition of that ECM or extracellular matrix is largely tissue dependent. So it can change depending on what tissue of the body you're interested in. These uh, natural ECMs are also largely self-assembled uh, depending once again on the tissue, they have different architectures. And most importantly, they're bioactive and they're dynamic. So I mentioned that there's this dynamic interplay and exchange of information between the resident cells and their surrounding material. Um, so 
The material can signal to the cells through mechanical forces or through biochemical cues and alter cell behavior. And in turn, the cells can exert forces on their surrounding material environment and remodel and reconfigure it to achieve a specific function. So th this is always happening um, just during normal homeostasis, but it, it also happens um, during instances of disease. And uh, in the biomaterials field, there are a number of approaches to harnessing the power of this um, biological ECM to study cell behavior. So many people work um, with decellularized natural matrices, as well as biologically sourced uh, polymers. And those have, have been uh, instrumental in understanding cell matrix interactions, but they do have some limitations. So deriving these from biology can lead to a lot of batch to batch variability. There can be issues with reproducibility and um, depending on your end use application, sometimes there may be issues with immunogenicity or toxicity um, as well. So for those reasons, synthetic platforms are also quite interesting. Um, specifically, they are chemically defined. We can add in um, diverse bioorthogonal chemistries to achieve something um, that nature doesn't necessarily have a, a readily available handle for. Um, but of course, with synthetic platforms, we have to be creative when we think about ways to introduce in bioactivity or dynamic properties. So they're typically bioinert and and they don't change um, unless you put in a mechanism to do that. And so my group is really focused on recapitulating this dynamic complexity of native ECM using synthetic materials. And we're doing that in a few different ways. And so um, to replicate some of the sequence specific behavior in natural extracellular matrices, we're using uh, the sequence defined biomimetic molecules called peptoids which I'll talk a lot more about today. And uh, namely, um, we know that monomer sequence is widely important to a lot of material properties. And so I'll speak about uh, a, a few in particular. My group is also interested in capturing the dynamic aspects of the native extracellular matrix. And one way we do that is by incorporating dynamic cross-linking chemistries um, that are holding the individual chains in the polymer network together, allowing for um, cell remodeling, cell reconfiguration. We also explore a variety of stimuli to change uh, bulk properties of the hydrogel. So on a more global scale, um, using things like light to um, alter mechanical properties or biochemical signaling factors. And we're also developing different quantitative analysis methods to examine cell behavior on our design platforms. So today I'm going to focus on some of our work in incorporating these sequence specific molecules uh, into our synthetic hydrogel platforms. And we know that monomer sequence is vastly important to control of, um, of a protein based material. So it's important in both matrix mechanics and degradation of the formed bulk material. And this is just one really nice example from Dave Terrell's group at Caltech in which they used um, these artificial coiled coiled proteins. So here's um, the amino acid sequence of that designed protein. These proteins could be um, self-assembled into physically cross-linked hydrogel networks due to associa association between the coils. And um, the formed hydrogels were viscoelastic in nature. So they had um, time dependent mechanical properties as exhibited by this uh, rheometry shown here. So what's interesting is that when they went and made single sites substitutions to this amino acid sequence, what they saw was that they could control the viscoelastic properties of the formed hydrogels over many orders of magnitude. So just altering one residue in this amino acid sequence could have a, a large impact. And that's really because of this exquisite relationship between um, the amino acid sequence, protein structure, and then how those proteins associate together. Uh, here's another nice example of the power of monomer sequence in biological matrices from Molly Stevens group. And so in this example, they used bacterial collagens and introduced in specific binding sites for 
uh, cellular integrins. So these are um, the linkages between the cell and their surrounding material. They also could introduce in binding domains for other materials and proteins such as hyaluronic acid or heparin. And they used sequence defined crosslinkers um, that were proteolytically degradable. So embedded cells will release enzymes like matrix metalloproteases that cleave this, their surrounding environment, allowing them to spread, to migrate, and to move through um, their, their matrix. And the rate at which they do that is largely dependent on um, the susceptibility of the material for those enzymes. So they could tune that using monomer sequence. So um, there are a lot of reasons why then we would want to control the uh, material properties using something like monomer sequence, but this has traditionally been pretty difficult using synthetic polymers. And uh, there are a lot of great ways to control monomer sequence using synthetic polymerization methods. I think all of these have various ways to control um, the sequence of a synthetic polymer, but they still are not quite at the level of what biology can do. And so biology will build the polypeptides and the ribosome, you know, step by step, adding each amino acid uh, one at a time. And sometimes we can harness biological machinery to control uh, sequence in a synthetic way using genetic engineering techniques or perhaps by incorporating in amino acids that have non-natural side chains so we can do um, orthogonal chemistry with them later. But um, if you want to use backbones that aren't necessarily uh, the same as the polypeptide, you're a little bit more limited um, in using biological machinery. So my group is definitely interested in controlling uh, monomer sequence in, in polymers, but we're also really interested in uh, understanding the impact of monomer sequence on polymer properties and on hydrogel properties. And so uh, for that reason, we chose to investigate a non-natural biomimetic polymer that can be made using just traditional solid phase chemistry. Um, that gives us the advantage of building our um, our polymers step by step, uh, one monomer unit at a time, such that we get a highly monodispersed batch of chains that all have the same sequence and the same length. Um, but there is a little bit of a trade off. So, the, the solid phase chemistry, um, we can't achieve high molecular weights with that, and the batch sizes tend to be small compared to some more traditional polymerization methods. But for um, a first investigation into how we could use sequence to control hydrogel properties, we thought this was really well suited for designing sequence specific crosslinkers. And the uh, biomimetic polymer that we have chosen to investigate are polypeptoids or N substituted glycines. And so the generic structure for those molecules is shown up here at the top. And you can see that they have the same chemical groups as peptides, um, they have a polyamide backbone, but uh, the side chains are arranged in a different way. And so um, polypeptoids are N-substituted, meaning that the side chain is coming off this backbone nitrogen instead of the alpha carbon as they do in peptides. And because of that, there's no backbone hydrogen bonding in these molecules. It changes their chirality as well. Um, also because of that, they're synthesized in a slightly different way. And so I mentioned we could use solid phase chemistry. And in particular, um, my group is using this submonomer method to build our peptoid molecules. And what that means is that each peptoid residue is built in two steps. The first step is the same for every residue. It involves a coupling agent like bromocetic acid. Um, and then the second step is where we build in our side chain functionality using commercially available primary amines. And there are dozens, if not hundreds, of, of primary amines available. And so the chemical diversity that we have access to is really quite large. Um, we can put in side chains that mimic those of the amino acids, or we can put in side chains that are completely different um, from what the amino acid alphabet has. So these two steps are iterated um, over and over until we get a, um, a peptoid chain of defined sequence and length. And it may come as no surprise, given their structural similarity to peptides, that peptoids have been investigated for a variety of biomaterial applications in the past. 
And I should mention that they're also amenable to sort of traditional ring opening polymerization methods as well. So here are just two examples um, with higher molecular weight peptoids that aren't sequence defined, uh, showing that they've been explored as micelles for drug delivery, as well as um, anti-fouling coatings. But their sequence specificity uh, given through solid phase method methods really enables interaction with biological molecules. So um, here's an example using sequence defined peptoids in which uh, the specificity enabled their application as a biomarker uh, for disease. And those solid phase methods can be combined with those of peptides to build hybrid molecules um, and as exhibited in this example, where they explored a sequence as a cancer therapeutic. So to begin to understand how we could harness the power of sequence to control synthetic material properties, we just first set out to make a simple uh, demonstration, um, taking a lot of inspiration from that protein hierarchical structure in which sequence controls structure and then structure um, gives rise to specific properties. And our thought was to uh, generate hydrogel networks using peptoid crosslinkers that were either structured or helical, as I'm showing here, um, as compared to hydrogels with unstructured peptoid crosslinkers. And so our thought was that um, the molecular rigidity imparted by peptoid helicity should yield a stiffer hydrogel, whereas um, the hydrogel with unstructured peptoid crosslinkers would be softer. And our goal here was really to tune uh, bulk stiffness without altering the network connectivity or the degradation properties of the hydrogel. And so normally um, in, in hydrogel synthesis, the way that we would control overall bulk modulus or elasticity is just by increasing the cross-linking density. And so to compare a soft and a stiff gel, you're looking at different network connectivities um, throughout the gel. But here we saw a way to achieve um, a difference in modulus without doing that. And to build our peptoid helices, um, we took, we followed design rules that have been previously published in the literature. So it's known that if you incorporate these bulky chiral aromatic side chains into the peptoid chain, you can sterically twist these peptoids into um, a loose helix. And in particular, using um, hexameric or trimeric repeat motifs is really important due to the structure of the helix, um, it allows a lot of those aromatics to stack along one base and stabilize the helix. We performed small angle neutron scattering studies to look at um, the impact of our helical sequence on chain rigidity. And so um, what this experiment enabled us to do was to um, fit a semi-flexible chain model to the scattering profiles from these peptoid helices in solution and back out this persistence length, which you can think of as um, basically the distance over which the molecule behaves like a rigid rod. So for our non-helical or unstructured peptoid linkages, um, we saw that for a variety of chain lengths, the persistence length was slightly less than a nanometer, whereas for the helical peptoid molecules, um, we saw a dependence on chain length and in particular, at shorter chain lengths, there was a greater difference in um, that persistence length between the helical and the non-helical peptoids. So if you look here at around 24 monomers, we were seeing persistence lengths on, in the range of about three, three and a half nanometers, um, which was quite a, a marked difference from the non-helical uh, chains. So for that reason, we, we focused on building crosslinkers that were approximately 20 monomers long or less. And to, in, um, to design these crosslinkers, we again, as I mentioned, use those bulky chiral aromatic residues um, as indicated here. We also incorporated uh, chiral carboxylic acids to confer water solubility since we wanted everything to be um, workable in, in just normal buffer. And we incorporated two thiol handles for cross-linking into a, a polymeric network. Our unstructured or non-helical peptoid uh, cross-linkers looked largely the same. Um, they had the same repeat motif, except the only difference was that we used a racemic mixture of that aromatic residue instead of one enantiomer. So using a racemic mixture allowed us to break up that helicity. 
Uh, and so just a little bit about our um, cross-linking chemistry. Uh, we are incorporating these into polyethylene glycol or PEG networks. Um, so these are multi-arm macromers that um, we can functionalize with something like a norbornene group at the end. And this thialine click chemistry proceeds um, in, in high yield and, and quite readily upon irradiation with a photo initiator um, like this small molecule lap and long wave UV light. So, so this chemistry is, is well established and has been used in a variety of hydrogel systems um, and gives us a, a path to um, ideal step growth networks. Uh, with the peptoids, um, it, it works quite nicely. So um, I mentioned many of the many others have used this chemistry, in, such as for crosslinkers like peptides. And so we were pleased to see that the peptoids gave us no trouble. And so here's just a quick validation that um, incorporation into these gels proceeded as expected, all using this um, helical peptoid crosslinker that was 14 monomers in length. You can see that as we just increase the amount of PEG uh, and put in an equivalent amount of the peptoid crosslinker, we see a corresponding increase in our storage modulus. Um, so this is one of the traditional ways to control hydrogel elasticity. And we get our highest uh, storage modulus uh, when we use a stoichiometric um, equivalent amount of the peptoid crosslinker. So adding less should decrease the observed uh, hydrogel stiffness that we see and adding too much crosslinker should also decrease the observed uh, storage modulus because a lot of these crosslinkers will just add um, on one chain end instead of uh, two chain ends, uh, thereby rendering them elastically ineffective. So we were pleased to see that our, our system was working nicely. Uh, so now as we started to vary the length of that peptoid helix, uh, we saw something more interesting and here I'm showing data for hydrogels cross-linked with peptoids that are 8, 14, or 20 residues long, and each of these are helical. And you can see that um, as we increase the length of the helix, the storage modulus or bulk stiffness of our hydrogel increased as well in quite a linear fashion. And so normally um, your rubber elasticity theory will predict that the as the molecular weight between crosslinks in your hydrogel platform increases, your storage modulus should correspondingly decrease um, because you're, you're creating much longer distance between um, th those joints in the network. But here we see the opposite. Uh, and really that speaks to being able to control the structure of our crosslinkers. And so if you recall, um, in our scattering data, we saw that there was quite a big difference uh, between um, the persistence length of the molecules at these short chain lengths, so, so right in here. Um, and so what we think is that we're still within the regime where we may even be below the persistence length for these helices. And so instead of um, behaving like semi-flexible chains as we increase the length, which might lead to a softer network, uh, they're behaving like rigid rods and allowing the networks to, to increase in stiffness as we um, increase the length of those peptoid helices. So we use circular dichroism to probe this a little bit more. Um, so here I'm showing the per residue molar ellipticity of the molecules uh, as we increase the helical length. And indeed, we did see that this per residue molar ellipticity increases as the chain length increases. So this just indicates that um, the helices are more and more stable as we go to longer and longer chain lengths. So we have yet to, to continue on this trend and see um, how going to even longer chain links would, might impact this. Um, but uh, we're excited that we have a way to control molecular, synthetic molecular structure using um, precise sequences. Okay, um, and so to investigate their suitability as cell culture platforms and start to probe how cells might be affected by um, uh, these types of materials, we first just did an experiment where we looked at their degradability when we challenged the gel with um, two different proteases that had broad activity, so collagenase and proteinase K. Comparison to, we first just compared to a hydrogel that was crosslinked with a peptide. And so normally what happens um, in these peptide crosslink systems is that 
these enzymes will rapidly degrade the crosslinkers, leading to um, bulk erosion of the gel and, and degradation. But with our peptoid linkages, um, what we see is that they're stable upon repeated challenge to both collagenase and proteinase K. So th this data was taken over the course of three days. Um, and again, that goes back to their end substitution, rendering them unrecognizable to, um, to sort of traditional cell secreted proteases. And so they may have some utility um, as materials that, can, that are stable over quite long times um, for both in vitro or perhaps even in vivo applications. Um, however, to support life cells, we, stu we do still need to incorporate a small um, cell adhesive motif. Um, it, it has been previously explored that um, uh, the analogous peptoid to something like an RGD molecule that can bind to cells doesn't work. And so we use just a, that RGD motif in a peptide configuration attached to teragels and then um, seeded human dermal fibroblasts on top. And in comparison to a peptide crosslink gel, we saw that um, the cells retained high viability. So live cells are shown in green here. On both substrates, we saw um, over 98% viable cells. And the cells look similar as compared to peptide crosslink gels. So um, for matched hydrogel substrates of similar stiffness, uh, we didn't see any significant differences in cell area or other morphological markers such as aspect ratio. Uh, so we are excited by this and um, are currently ex uh, working on exploring different markers of cell behavior when we tune stiffness just with the structure of the crosslinkers. And so um, just to wrap up this first part of the talk, I will mention that that non-helical linker as well uh, showed a marked decrease in stiffness from our helical um, peptoid crosslinkers. So for the same length, uh, we see a, a drastic decrease in the storage modulus um, on the order, you know, of about, so these are on the order of about 300 pascals or so, whereas the helical gels um, for the same network connectivity, same polymer concentration, and same cross-linker length are showing something above about 1,000 pascals. So these are quite soft, but um, well within the range that mimics soft tissues. Okay, so I want to, um, in the next part of my talk, I want to switch gears a little bit and um, uh, mention that with these peptoid linkers, we can control degradation properties as well. And so I just showed you some data indicating that, you know, th these aren't degraded by normal cell secreted proteases, um, but oftentimes in different tissue engineering scaffolds, you do want something that is degradable by the cells. And this is to allow cellular migration, allow cellular spreading, particularly in 3D encapsulations. And so having something like a peptoid that doesn't degrade is, is not very functional for your platform, um, depending on the application. And so here's just a schematic uh, showing how others have achieved these properties using proteolytically degradable peptides. So here's a, a cell embedded in a hydrogel matrix as it secretes um, these MMPs or matrix metalloproteases, they will cleave the peptide crosslinkers. And in this particular system, they incorporated this quenched uh, fluorophore pair um, such, that when the when, such that when the peptide substrates were cleaved, they uh, enabled fluorescence so you could track where um, the cells were cleaving the matrix in real time. And we were curious as to whether um, taking these sequences and uh, adapting our peptoid uh, molecules to them would help with increasing specificity. So these are widely used um, in a variety of cell culture hydrogels, but one thing is that there tends to be a lot of overlap in the specificity between um, the, the peptide substrates. And so they'll be susceptible to a variety of MMPs. And if you want to really get at specificity for just one specific MMP, that can be really hard to do. Uh, and so we turned to the literature to see, um, to look at the consensus sequences that have been derived for a variety of these peptide substrates. And what we were really intrigued by was um, this enrichment of proline at one of the sequence sites. 
um, right at the active site in these peptide substrates. And so proline, uh, here's just another way to look at that same data. You can see that proline is enriched here. And I'll just remind you that um, proline is an N-substituted amino acid, just like our, uh, our peptoids are as well. And so we thought that um, swapping out that proline for a variety of peptoids might lead to an avenue where we could increase specificity by really harnessing the power of the non-natural side chains of the peptoid monomers. And so this data here is shown for a variety of collagenases, um, so MMP1813, for example, um, and uh, collagen uh, is one of the most abundant extracellular matrix proteins. And so um, we decided to start with this consensus sequence and then swap out specific residues for our peptoids. And so here's just a schematic of our, of our library. Um, that P3 position, like I said, corresponds to a specific site in the uh, consensus peptide chain. Um, we decided to use peptoids with side chains that mimic those in the parent peptide sequence. And we did this for each site uh, along the chain. So um, each of the specific peptide peptoid hybrids are listed out here. We also synthesized um, the parent peptide sequence as a control, as well as a sequence that was 100% peptoid, um, also as a control. And we attach that quenched uh, fluorophore pair onto the ends of our molecules such that when they um, hopefully were cleaved by uh, proteolytic enzymes, um, the, one of the fluorophores would be liberated, allowing us to track both cleavage and the kinetics of that in real time. And so this, we use this as a platform to analyze rate and specificity to, to different collagenolytic MMPs. We first just tested our library against crude collagenase, so um, isolated from bacteria. And we were excited to see cleavage for a variety of these sequences. So each of these colors corresponds to a different hybrid substrate with just one peptoid uh, residue in the active site. And when we took a little bit closer look at this, um, we saw that these chains were actually cleaving at two positions. So both cleavage sites are indicated by these dashed lines here, and each of these little bubbles indicates a different residue in our chain. And the, the nomenclature for these cleavage sites is listed below. So it was either right in the middle of the chain that the enzyme was cutting or one position over. And we could look at the frequency of um, these cleavage sites for each of the molecules in our library. And so the peptide predominantly cleaves at one site um, as highlighted in green, but it shows a little bit of a secondary cleavage site as well when exposed to collagenase. Our peptoid peptide hybrids, however, um, really altered uh, where, they, where they were getting cleaved based upon their sequence. And um, taking another look at this in a different way, basically what we noticed was that um, whenever there was a peptoid substituent in that P3 position, it could still cleave as predicted by the literature. But there were several other sites where peptoid substituents were tolerated as well. So for example, um, the P1, which is right at that, that cleavage site, uh, P2 and P3. So we next um, took our library and exposed them to those collagenolytic uh, human MMPs, so MMP1, 8, and 13. Um, and we saw replication of the behavior using crude collagenase, um, but most importantly, just for MMP13. And so when we exposed our library to um, each of these, both MMP1 and MMP8 only showed significant cleavage of the peptide, which is shown in black here. Um, but for uh, MMP13, we saw cleavage to a variety of these, of these molecules. And again, the best performers um, had that peptoid substituent in those well-tolerated positions, so the P1, uh, P3, and P3 prime. And so this is very much ongoing work, but we're excited to see that um, we can influence the specificity of a parent consensus sequence um, for specific MMPs just by using these single site substitutions of peptoid residues. So I'll remind you that um, we took this, this black uh, curve, which corresponds to the parent peptide. It had roughly equivalent susceptibilities to each of these three MMPs, but now by making these targeted substitutions with 
um, the non-natural residues, we can really bias cleavage towards one MMP versus another. And so there's a lot of room for library optimization here. This was just a very small test library, but because we have so many primary means at our disposal, we can start to um, expand that library and, and really get at uh, what features are important for specificity. And so to wrap up, I'll just say, um, hopefully I've shown you that we can utilize the structure of these synthetic molecules to control hydrogen mechanics. Um, we can also use the specificity of these peptoids to enhance their susceptibility to cell secreted proteases uh, in a targeted way. And that overall um, a chain of 100% peptoid residues are stable to enzymes with broad activity. And so we're really excited to continue developing hydrogel platforms that have these programmed degradation properties or defined mechanics, um, as well as design bioactivity using these completely synthetic molecules. I'd like to acknowledge the students that performed most of this work. So um, Logan Morton did a lot of the hydrogel mechanics work that I talked about in the first part of the talk, and Mariah Austin um, did some of the did a lot of the MMP work. I'd also like to thank the funding sources, so um, as, as listed here. Uh, and of course, thank you once again to the organizers and to the hosts for the invitation to come and speak. So I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much, Adrian. Uh, super interesting talk. So we've got a couple questions in the Q&A. So one uh, question is regarding anti-fouling coatings, what is the expected mechanism? And is it resulting from the antimicrobial activity of the peptoids or due to the creation of an anti-adhesive surface? Yeah, those are, that's a great question. And I think that it's probably one of the most investigated uh, peptoid applications. And so both for biofouling and marine anti-fouling. Um, and there have been a lot of different mechanisms explored. Um, you can make peptoids that mimic the hydrophilic properties of PEG, where maybe you're getting like a, a water layer on the film. You can make zwitter ionic peptoids where charge is important, um, hydrophobic molecules as well. So I think there is not one general consensus on how anti-fouling in peptoids works. Um, the antimicrobial mechanism that you mentioned has also been uh, nicely explored, and there are a variety of uh, charged and helical peptoids that have been explored as antimicrobials. And so there, um, there's some really nice structure property relationships in the literature exhibiting how um, the helicity as well as cationic charge can penetrate different uh, cell membranes. Um, but for, for anti-fouling coatings, I'm not sure that those have necessarily been combined. Okay, great. Uh, so another question, kind of a maybe a follow-up question. So um, have you tested the antimicrobial activity and possible bacterial resistance of developed peptoids? We have not. Um, we have just tested their cytotoxicity to mammalian cells, but as I mentioned, there's, there's been a lot of work on peptoids as antimicrobials. So it ends up being largely sequence dependent, um, just like it would be for a peptide. So there are cytotoxic or antimicrobial peptoid sequences, and there are ones that are very friendly to cells as well, um, really depending on what you're putting into those side chains and how that affects the resulting structure of the molecule. Okay, great. Um, we have time for another question, if anybody has one. Okay. Well, um, if not, I'd like to thank Adrian again for the, for the talk and taking the time uh, this morning and Port afternoon in Portugal. <laughs> I really, really enjoyed it. Thank, thanks a lot, Adrian. Yeah, thanks again. Okay, great. So uh, we are now going to take a break. So until 3.30 uh, p.m. in Portugal and 9.30 Austin. And so uh, that should give you all a little bit of a chance to stretch your legs, that sort of thing. 
And then uh, when we come back, um, okay, so we're coming back at 3.45 Portugal time, 9.45 Austin time. And when we come back, Paulo Ferreira will uh, take over as, as moderating the, the uh, second half of the session. All right, so um, we'll, we'll see you soon in about 15 minutes or so. All right. All right, um, uh, welcome uh, back um, to the Masterclass One, Innovation in Biomimetic Materials. Um, so my name is uh, Paulo Ferreira, I will be the moderator for this uh, session. Uh, as Brian mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, I'm actually one of the area coordinators of the Austin uh, um, Portugal program uh, in nanotechnologies, um, uh, together with uh, Carlos Silva, uh, from CTEF. Um, I'm actually a, a group leader and uh, head of the uh, microscopy center at the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory and also a professor at the University of Lisbon at IST. So um, without further ado, uh, let me uh, um, uh, start. We will have as uh, kind of the first speaker. Um, uh, it's going to be uh, uh, Martin Lopez Garcia. Uh, he's a, a group leader in the natural and artificial uh, phototonic, uh, photonic structures and devices laboratory in the nanophotonics department at the International Iberian Nanotechnology Laboratory. Uh, currently, uh, Martin uh, investigates light manipulation at micro and nano scale in natural systems, as well as in integrated devices using state of the art fabrication and characterization technologies. So we'll have a 30 minute presentation by Martin and then followed by Q and A uh, uh, session. Please go ahead, uh, Martin, thanks. Thanks, Paulo. Um, let me just... Um... I'm sorry in the... Uh -huh. Uh, so um, I hope uh, can you actually see properly my screen or yes it's fine Thanks. okay okay so um, well sorry about that uh, so first of all thanks for the kind introduction and also to all the people involved in the organization of this uh, nice uh, master class it was really cool to see um, the first presentations and also all the topics addressed. So today I'm um, so I'm going to be presenting part of the research we do in in my group at INL, which has to do with uh, how we manipulate light with nanotechnology, and uh, but especially on how nature does manipulate light with uh, with uh, nanostructures, and what can we learn from that, and also if we can even use it for some of the uh, nanotechnology applications we um, we are investigating right so there is a little bit of uh, understanding or trying to figure it out how nature is doing it but also plenty of uh, actually uh, using nature uh, as a as an inspiration but before i get into the details on what we are actually doing just let me uh, maybe well, uh, maybe I don't need to remind you, but uh, you, you know very well that uh, actually manipulating light is at the core of many of the most important technologies uh, nowadays, right? I mean, uh, for example, energy collection is definitely one of the, of, the, of the main technologies that comes to our mind when we think about uh, light manipulation or light harvesting. But then you can find uh, um, manipulation of light through different technologies in displays, illumination, imaging, well, you, you name it, right? And um, I think the core um, message uh, I want to send today is that uh, not only the material is important, but also how we nanostructure that material when it comes to uh, actually addressing uh, nanotechnologies for light manipulation, right? And in all these technologies you, should hear, uh, you see here, apart from a huge development in material science, there has been also a huge development on how to integrate those materials, how to nanostructure them, for example, to produce uh, 
to produce different uh, different colors in the LEDs, right? And uh, and of course, um, nature got there first, uh, as usual with many of uh, many other applications, right? And um, <clears throat> and uh, and actually, this example is quite a. Uh, I would say a nice one is probably you have seen peacocks around or many other birds that show these very strong, uh, very bright colors at different wavelengths. And uh, the interesting uh, part or the interesting bit about uh, technolo technological applications here is that these colors in many cases are not produced by a, by a, a dye molecule. So they are not produced by absorption, but they are actually produced by pure uh, morphology, pure nanostructuration. So you take a material which otherwise may be transparent, you nanostructure it at the, with the right uh, pattern, and actually through just pure light interference, if you uh, design it uh, with the right parameters, right, you may obtain a very strong uh, constructive interference, so a very strong color for a particular wavelength. This is the most obvious uh, function of these um, structures in nature and you have probably seen it uh, one million times there are from the most simple structure just a simple multi-layer to the very complex nanostructure like in the butterflies that produce this very strong blue colors through this sort of christmas tree uh, protein structures no <clears throat> but again uh, the important uh, parameter here is always that this nanostructuring is on the order of the wavelength of the light we are investigating. And of course, because we are uh, we are humans, we are attracted by these bright colors, but in reality, there is much more to it than only bright colors. In reality, apart from producing this bright coloration, we can explore other functionalities for those uh, nanostructures. And in fact, talking about biomimetics of these nanostructures. Uh, there has been many examples already in literature on, for example, designing very efficient uh, sensors, out of color colorimetric sensors, just rep replicating the butterfly nanostructures in the lab, for example. Or one of my, uh, let's say, favorite um, uh, uh, topics of interest is actually how to enhance uh, light absorption and uh, in particular for example how to enhance photocatalysis just by nanostructuring the materials you are considering on a way that actually light will be trapped by that that sort of nanostructure in this example here for, for example they use uh, they mimic this opal structure which is a mineral you can find in uh, in australia for example <clears throat> and just by nanostructuring the material with that same shape, you obtain as a very strong enhancement in the absorption at the, uh, at the photocathodes of the, of, of the photocatalytic system. Right? So th these are two examples which are well explored, but uh, give us a very good idea on where these uh, mimetics of just these uh, colorful systems can take us. But today I'm, uh, I'm actually focusing on a different light harvesting process uh, in photosynthesis, arguably the most important uh, light harvesting process for life, uh, right? Um, and and this is somehow a surprising uh, a surprising uh, uh, case because while we have been studying all all this uh, other uh, type of nanophotonic structures in nature. It happens that in the case of photosynthesis, uh, the community is very well aware of uh, how photosynthesis works. Uh, we know a lot about the biochemistry of photosynthesis, even how the uh, botany, of course, we know a lot about how the plant works. But in terms of uh, whether the structuration of the inside the cells of that tissue where photosynthesis take, uh, takes place, it has been quite uh, overlooked in terms of uh, of uh, of um, of uh, nanophotonic properties. So the, the nanostructuring of of the tissue uh, uh, for photosynthesis has not been explored too much in that direction. And for me, this is surprising because you might expect that uh, for sure, if uh, uh, an organism like a bird 
uh, might use uh, photonics, you might expect that actually in something as important for light harvesting as photosynthesis, photonics may also play a role, right? And this is basically what we are uh, um, what we are investigating in my group, in part, uh, in my group. And of course, uh, this is driven by uh, scientific knowledge, but it's also driven by important uh, technological uh, questions, right? And um, as you are probably aware, photosynthesis is uh, interesting in many aspects. Uh, probably one of the most um, interesting at the moment or most um, studied worldwide is so-called artificial photosynthesis, uh, especially because through water splitting, uh, we can obtain a clean energy production, right? So there is a huge community working on this direction. And I think there, uh, the light manipulation obviously uh, plays an important role, right? But there are other aspects, like for example, a crop yield enhanced uh, through uh, photosynthesis manipulation, which has uh, been uh, drawing plenty of, uh, of attention lately. So all, all these are aspects that we think that by understanding if actually nanostructures in the plant cells manipulate uh, light, we can uh, also produce uh, huge impacts on this on this type of technology. <clears throat> and that's actually what we do in, in the group. So we, we have a very strong line of research on studying uh, systems where photonics, so nanostructures uh, related with light interaction and photosynthesis meet in nature. We want to understand how does it happening, but we also explore how to use that as an inspiration to actually introduce that into already known devices. So you can, of course, think immediately at, at a solar cell, right? But there are many other examples I, um, I hope I can come across today. And finally, we also investigate, apart from understanding those functions and trying to mimic them, we think there is plenty of potential also on actually using those materials themselves, uh, those nanostructural materials themselves as part of uh, uh, as part of nanophotonic devices or even in other applications. And today I will talk a little bit uh, on this first part, on the photonics of photosynthesis, but mostly I will focus on how to extract biomaterials with photonic properties directly from, uh, from photosynthetic systems. <clears throat> And, um, and of course, we, we are doing this for some, some particular properties we found on these systems, right? And, uh, and without getting into too much detail, I just wanted to mention here probably the four more important ones that, uh, at least from my point of view, we can uh, are worth um, investigating these, uh, these systems for. One is that uh, biologists and biophysicists have uh, come across that these nanostructures might play an important role in, photo pro in for photoprotection in, in, in plants, algae, or microalgae. Another one is that actually, in fact, as I will show later, even the absorption could be tailored in, in these systems. Uh, and immediately one can think that uh, you might want to tailor absorption in many other technologies, like photocatalysis, for example, right? Uh, finally, something that has not been very explored is how this uh, nanostructuring might affect the photochemistry, in fact, in photosynthesis itself, but other, other processes in the cells as well. And the last one uh, that I already mentioned is this uh, possibility to produce very resilient and bright colors with materials uh, using simple, relatively uh, easy to, uh, to fabricate materials, no? like biosilica, for example. So these are four properties that are definitely very technologically interesting and that uh, and that are behind our uh, our interest for the, for these systems as well. Okay, so let me start by showing you then uh, in this first uh, part of my talk, I, I would like to show you very briefly one uh, I would say key example on how photonics and photosynthesis uh, can interact in a, in a natural system. So this, what you see here at the bottom uh, right is a, a leaf of a, a begonia uh, a plant. And, uh, and as in any plant, you, uh, you will probably expect 
that leaf to be a green leaf, right? Uh, because the main pigment is chlorophyll basically there. So what happened uh, here is that these leaves actually under certain conditions, they will show a very strong blue uh, coloration. Actually, this, this type of begonia is called uh, peacock begonia. And the reason for that is that this blue uh, coloration is in fact uh, quite metallic. The, the aspect is quite metallic. So we, we didn't uh, know why, why this co uh, was causing this color. And uh, so then we approach it in, the, in our optical microscope. And what you see here on the left are the, are the organelles responsible for this coloration. These are actually chloroplasts, so it's where photosynthesis, in fact, take place in the plant. But in this case, they, they produce this very strong blue reflectance. And this is quite striking because you saw the main pigment here is chlorophyll, so you will, we will expect a green coloration, right? So we inspect it even closer with uh, TEM and SCM, and we realize that in reality, there, the the reason why uh, this blue strong coloration was taking place is because the membranes are stratified in the way you see uh, here. So each of these membranes contain the, uh, the pigments, but then each membrane is separated from each other a very well defined distance. And indeed, this distance is the appropriate distance to produce light interference between the different layers for the for the this uh, the blue uh, color and that's the reason why we see this blue uh, this strong blue color as i said at the beginning the the blue color is interesting and uh, and biologists have been uh, looking at these colorations for uh, different functionalities uh, but indeed what we uh, found and uh, what is uh, interesting from a technological perspective i believe is that by producing this strong blue reflectance, in fact, uh, the structure is uh, enhancing the absorption in the green just through light interference. So I, I won't get into the details on this particular effect here. You can uh, ask me uh, later if you want or just have a look on the paper, but, uh, but that's very interesting because these plants live in a very dark environment, a very dark environment where only the green light is available. So that means that this photonic structure might actually be, if you want, a design appropriately tuned for the wavelengths to absorb the wavelengths available where this plant lives. So immediately one can think that this type of approach uh, could be extrapolated to, for example, solar cell, solar cell technology. You know? And we are actually working on similar um, biomimetic approaches on, on that direction for this, for this system. So, um, so this was a quick, uh, just a quick example on uh, on how photonics and photosynthesis can uh, can mix to in a natural system to enhance the light uh, harvesting capabilities. But let me now change uh, gears a little bit and uh, moving into the main topic of uh, of my talk. Uh, which is uh, at the moment a core research line we are uh, following, and um, and is more related with how to extract uh, directly uh, nanophotonic materials from nature, rather than just using it as inspiration, as in the previous example I shown. Uh, here we're interested in just extracting those materials and using them in particular applications. And this example, actually, this is one of the organisms we investigate in this direction in the lab, but it's probably the most uh, uh, the most suitable example are uh, diatomicroalgae. So diatomicroalgae, for those of you who are not familiar, are unicellular organisms. I mean, you can find them almost everywhere in any aquatic environment on Earth. And this is actually uh, quite a relevant organism for uh, us all because it, it, it can produce, it's, well, it's not uh, an exact number, but it, it seems it can produce up to 50% of all of the oxygen available in, on Earth. So you can imagine that's quite uh, interesting from an environmental perspective, especially uh, regarding the current climate situation, right? Uh, 
so the fundamental studies on this direction are uh, very much welcome uh, on that uh, on that sense but what we are interested uh, in particular here is that they are actually a, a source of uh, they can be a source of nanophotonic material and the reason for that is that the the peculiarity of diatoms is that the whole cell is contained within a, a glass exoskeleton as a biosilica exoskeleton so th this is uh, formed through a biomineralization process in, in in the aquatic environment where they live and they can come depending on the species at the most uh, exotic shapes so you can see here just an example of all the shapes you can find in nature the, there are hundreds of thousands of different species so you can find really uh, many different shapes but what is of interest for us is that all those shapes uh, when you look closer uh, you might f you what you find is that the silica membranes that form the exoskeleton present a very well defined uh, micro and nanoporous patterning and this this uh, micro and nanoporosity is so well defined that they form this uh, for example this hexagonal uh, lattices with quite a large uh, period as you see here no this lattice has about uh, one to two microns period and this has triggered in the past uh, much interest because uh, a, pe a periodic structure around the wavelength of the light of interest in this case the visible uh, always means that there might be some type of photonic interaction there so this has been explored uh, quite uh, quite a bit actually there is uh, quite a uh, extensive literature on this direction and uh, from my point of view uh, it's a very interesting scaffold material is highly porous uh, biosilica meaning that that is easy to functionalize for different applications and this has been explored for example for in photocatalysis uh, applications no using the the this biosilica as a, as a scaffold for uh, photocathodes, for example. Uh, but the photonic uh, properties, meaning how this structure manipulates light, or if it, it even does manipulate li light at all in a, let's say, in a relevant uh, way, it has been a bit elusive uh, in the literature from my, from my perspective. And, and that's why we uh, decided to, instead of focusing on the on the part of the diatom which has been mostly explored which is what we call here the valve is this top and bottom uh, parts here of the exoskeleton we, we have been focusing on what is called the griddle band which is this membrane uh, this uh, uh, sort of belt that encloses the uh, the exoskeleton and when we extract the, those griddles and we have a, a closer look you find this is a very well defined silica membrane uh, and with this sort of a split ring shape so this is already quite interesting from uh, from a light capturing pr perspective but what is really uh, exciting is that uh, when one looks uh, even closer we find out that uh, in reality the whole membrane is perforated by this very well defined lattice of uh, micro or nanopores if you want and uh, and to me it's uh, astonishing to see that this lattice is so uh, well uh, so well organized because in most of the photonic systems in nature when you find lattice of this uh, of this type uh, the disorder plays a very important role no? so here however the the order is is extremely good also, the period is in the order of the of the on the scale that we will expect for a strong uh, interaction with light, and this immediately uh, made us think about those very uh, very high tech devices that we fabricate uh, using uh, very expensive and time consuming uh, technologies like even lithography, for example. What you see here in this inset is a. Uh, a classical example of a photonic device fabricated with um, electron beam lithography is a silicon membrane where uh, the authors perforated a very similar lattice to the one I'm showing here. Um, and you see that the, the areas are not amazing. So uh, 
you can see immediately that the comparison is quite uh, is quite uh, outstanding. But there are other interesting aspects uh, to these membranes, and it's the fact that uh, the membrane is highly porous also in the inner side. So it's not only that the lattice is very well uh, is a very well organized, which is important for the photonic properties. It's also that uh, actually the internal uh, structure is quite rich. So this is a rendering of the internal structure of, of the membranes. And you can see each pore is connected between themselves. Um, the people, uh, the biologists investigating these uh, systems believe that th this uh, high porosity might be related with exchange of uh, with the outside of the cell. Uh, so it's a sort of microfluidic channel. But still, it uh, it has uh, plenty of uh, interest from the photonics per perspective because now that we know the structure, we can actually investigate what are the optical properties. And for example, we were able to measure that indeed this uh, this very well structured material behaves like in the case of the bear that I saw at the beginning. No? But this periodicity induces a very strong reflectance at a particular wavelength. In this case, in the near infrared. So we don't know the biological functions for this, but definitely uh, a strong reflectance in the near infrared is something we could use in different uh, in different applications. Uh, moreover, we we also uh, observe uh, color production again, as expected from a very well ordered system like, like this one, um, <clears throat> and that keeps us thinking. Uh, okay, so we know now that we have a system that is produced by nature uh, with a very well uh, defined photonic properties so let's see what uh, what type of applications we can found no, for this system and it happens that uh, in, indeed biosilica produced by the atoms is already been used in, in in many applications from let's say very simple applications like uh, insecticide for your pets at home or even high-tech applications like in, uh, as a uh, filtering material for blood, for example, in biomedical applications. But all these applications are, have nothing to do with light manipulation. And the reason is, in part, I believe, is that uh, all this material that you can buy off the shelf in reality comes from mining, uh, for example, in, in, uh, in the States. Uh, and of course, the quality of this fossilized uh, uh, microalgae is not amazing. So the, the optical quality is quite poor. And that's why we mostly work in reality with the strains that we cultivate in the lab that we can actually uh, grow on demand under different conditions. So we can actually control uh, those conditions and also the quality of, uh, of the material we grow. And with that, we, we were able to indeed develop a methodology where we can start by the uh, by using the actual uh, microalgae culture and we just remove the organic components using uh, different chemicals then we uh, we proceed with the separation of the different parts of the exoskeleton so we we are able to keep only the those parts which are photonic in this case the, the so-called griddle band you can find the details about this in this publication actually on how to do this separation and finally, we are able actually to deposit them on a control manner on a substrate. And that renders quite well defined and flat, uh, uh, again, nano patterns, no? as you can see here. <clears throat> so, and just, uh, and just to, to reach the, the final uh, part of my talk, uh, I would like to mention that, uh, of course, we in order to allocate this uh, uh, these natural uh, photonic structures to to any application, we need to know where we stand for the for their quality, no, and, and how they compare to uh, current technologies. For example, here you can see the comparison again with a silicon a membrane fabricated in the clean room. And for that, we did uh, quite a thorough study on, a study on different strains we are growing in the lab. And this uh, is probably, to me, one of the most exciting uh, findings that indeed the, the period, which is the most important uh, parameter uh, in terms of photonics, is maintained between 
uh, specimens and even between strengths of the same uh, of the same uh, species. So as long as you keep the species, there is a variation of about only five nanometers in the period of the whole lattice, which is really uh, really impressive in terms of of disorder for photonic applications. And this brings me to the to the last slides of my talk. Uh, so obviously we are we want to manipulate that nanopatterning. It will be fantastic to to find ways to to do it, and we are investigating those. Uh, different approaches to that. Uh, from the fundamental point of view, we want to understand what role, they, they, if any, they play in photosynthesis at all in this microalgae. And finally, and probably one of the most exciting ones, is to find ways to upscale the production of very well-controlled strengths. So then we can actually produce enough uh, material to be used in, in specific applications. No? Uh, and with this, I would like just to mention my uh, my tech home messages, uh, which in general, which are uh, on the one hand side that indeed there is still plenty to learn uh, and plenty of inspiration to gather on how we manipulate light in our uh, technologies from uh, from natural organisms, especially I think from unicellular organisms are quite promising for that, and. And my second uh, takeaway is that uh, actually we can even extract those devices in the future, or at least part of those devices, directly from the natural systems. And with this, uh, of course, I would like to thank all the team who has uh, worked on this uh, to obtain all these uh, nice results. And I would like to mention the collaborators, especially Sona and Matt, who are actually uh, collaborators from the from UT Austin, where, as you probably know, there is the largest uh, microalgae collection in the world. So this is really nice to have them on board on this. And of course, I would like to thank all the, all the funding bodies for this and you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Martin, uh, for this excellent talk. I mean, it was really uh, fascinating to see uh, uh, this kind of uh, behavior and also uh, research. Um, uh, let's uh, uh, see if there are any questions. There's actually one here uh, in the queue. Uh, and the question is this from Carla. Uh, do you think uh, we could explore uh, a different range of visible colors for dyeing several substrates using microalgae? Uh, I guess the, the question goes in the, in the direction of... Uh, yeah, so here this... It shows green, right? Uh, so this is dependent on the period of the, in this in this particular case, on the periodicity, on the scale of the periodicity. You know? So if we can manipulate or we can find algae that show different periods, for sure we can tune the color or the for for different uh, uh, wavelengths. Uh, that there is no one of the main properties of uh, so-called structural color or color produced by photonic structures is that as long as the material doesn't change the refractive index, the scalability of the wavelength only depends on the size of the features. Uh, so the answer is, I guess, yes, yeah, we could. Uh, so I, I welcome um, uh, other questions, please, uh, if you can uh, you write them down. Uh, in the meantime, I, maybe I, I, can, I, I can ask a question, which is, uh, you mentioned um, uh, the fact that you have this uh, uh, regular uh, pore structure um, to a point that there is only very small variations. You said uh, something like five nanometers or so. But I, I notice mm -hmm. in your images that there are areas within the structure that they don't have any pores at all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, uh, is there, um, what is the relevance of that? Uh, uh, not, I think they have one of the images you can see from the top. Yeah, exactly that. In some cases, the pores are totally missing. Uh, mm. There is one example there, and if you look at the maybe more wide view, there are many pores missing. Uh, I mean, do you uh, you know what is the relevance of that? Well, that's that's a very um, yeah. Actually, that's very relevant from a photonics perspective. And I don't know if it's relevant from the biological perspective, actually. <laughs> so it's a, it's a very interesting uh, question. We always get in any, uh, let's say, more photonic uh, photonics community. Uh, so from the biological perspective, 
perspective, uh, I don't know uh, what relevance that could, that could have. It's true that uh, we have analyzed the number of defects per area, and we have found that you find one defect every 100 holes, which is low, quite low, actually, I would say, no? Um, for at least for our for our uh, in our perspective um, then for the photonics applications uh, usually if you fabricate a photonic crystal in the clean room a photonic crystal a photonic structure like this one the way to fabricate a nano cavity for light is actually to to leave a defect like this so uh, that's very interesting because uh, that means uh, eventually this could be a nano cavity for li so light could be trapped on that <laughs> on that uh, defect. Uh, but well, uh, yeah, let's say biologically, yeah, I'm not sure uh, what what uh, what could be the. But yeah, it's a very interesting, uh, definitely, effect. Yeah. All right, thank you. Um, then the other question. Well, I guess if not. Uh, uh, let me thank you, uh, Martin, for your uh, very interesting contribution. And then uh, okay. I think I will uh, move on into uh, uh, the next speaker. Um, the next speaker will be uh, Professor João Mano. He is uh, a full professor in the Department of Chemistry at the University of Aveiro uh, and director of the Compass Research Group from CSEC. Uh, at the uh, Aveiro Institute of Materials. Uh, his research interests include uh, bio-inspired materials, cell and tissue engineering, and, and, ato and nanomicro uh, platforms for biomedicine. And he's going to talk about bio-inspired tools for the development of materials and devices for biomedicine. And again, I, I invite everyone to um, uh, submit uh, questions uh, so that we uh, we can discuss them uh, after the the talk by Professor Romana. Uh, Professor Romana, please uh, welcome. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, uh, Professor Jomano. Um, I'm not sure if you're able to connect. Uh, Professor Romano, I, I see you in the attendees, but I think you need to move into the panelists for some reason. Okay, I think you are there now. Can you can you see me? Yes, yes. Uh, Thank okay. you very much. Okay, so I will share my, my screen. Um, So thank you very much for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to, to share with you some, some of our interest in trying to uh, use the nature as an inspiration to develop new, uh, new materials and devices, special for, for biomedical application. So we, in our group, we are really at the interface between material cells, biomedicine. So of course we are working a lot with biomaterials. And th this image shows some some possible materials that are widely used in clinical applications and that have been very very important in the, uh, increasing the quality of life of patients and you can you can uh, 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 understand some application many 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 people are using this kind of prosthesis and implantable devices both for structural and for functional point of points of view of course, um, there are still several uh, problems that these materials that are already in the clinics uh, cannot uh, solve because the defects are too big, because of the problems are too complex, 
some diseases and clinical conditions can really not be uh, solved by these, uh, these kind of uh, biomaterials. And that's why there are a lot of people trying to develop more performance uh, biomaterials and devices for, for this kind of application. And I, I'm sure that most of the, the audience is, uh, is uh, uh, as an engineering, a more engineering background. And of course, uh, you can realize that there is not one way to solve a particular problems. Usually there are several ways to solve a problem. And one possibility is really to try to learn with nature and try to see how nature has evolved in terms of uh, 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 ways to resolve problems and uh, as we saw there are very interesting and I will try to put the pointer okay we saw in the very nice presentation before the optical properties and photonic properties that uh, nature already implemented in their in, in their surfaces but we can also play with shape and design and geometry to to solve different kinds of problems in engineering of course, surfaces, and I will explore much more in, in my presentation of today. Also, mechanical properties try to solve, to use hierarchical systems and design from the, really from the molecular scale up to micro scale to increase mechanical properties, in particular toughness, and also magnetic. So there are some examples that I'm showing here where we can really take lessons from nature in order to improve uh, some solutions. And my first, present, uh, my first example is related with the use of this very famous superhydrophobic surface. I, I'm sure that most of you know that, surf, that uh, some surfaces in nature, are, they are really water repellent. The, of course, the most well-known uh, surface is the lotus leaf, which is uh, where the contact angle of water can reach 160 degrees. And there are some other examples that I'm showing in here in these slides and that you can realize that uh, uh, they are really very water repellent. And in the common aspect in all of these surfaces is really topography. And so the secret, and this is very well known, that the secret is again topography like that, that we saw before on the, the light uh, responsive system. Um, and so the, 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 the idea is that we cannot have this kind of super hydrophobic surface just by having a, a very hydrophobic surface. We really need to combine with nano and micro roughness that will provide and theoretically it's very well known why, why we have this kind of behavior. So um, in our group and in many groups, people are trying to uh, synthesize and, and uh, uh, and produced super hydrophobic surface from different, using different types of materials. In this particular work, we used a biodegradable polymer and just using a, 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 a solvent based method, which is quite simple. We could produce surfaces that exhibit both micro and nano roughness. And you can see that when we start with a smooth material, we have a quite hydrophobic uh, surface, but after uh, modif modifying the surface with no extra chemical modification, we can have this kind of super hydrophobic surfaces. So in biomedical application, this kind of surface can be applied in many, in some applications. So we can, for example, develop antimicrobial textiles or systems that repeal bloods um, uh, or to use as controlled drug delivery systems because the water will be uh, we will degrade or will impregnate much more in the, in, its, in the much more efficient way the release of substances that are inside the material. So we can also use this kind of super hydrophobic surface. And in, in our group, we have been working a lot on trying to use this as platforms for screening. So we can, um, we can uh, uh, deposit different types of biomaterials or, or droplets with proteins and in a high throughput way, we can evaluate what is the difference between its each spots that are completely isolated from the others because we have super hydrophobic regions that that is that surrounding that surround each of the, the spots. So also we and, and this I would like to, to show an examples try to use these platforms as a bio inspired. Uh, uh, template to process particles. And I would like to show you some examples on how we can do that. 
So this, this example is really shows a, a straightforward way to process particles and particles are very important for biomedical application. They can encap encapsulate drugs or cells for different types of, of uh, therapies, including in tissue engineering. So to accommodate cells in the three dimensional matrix that can generate a, mic a, mic micro, -tissue, a mic micro tissue. So our idea was to try to use these super hydrophobic surfaces to support droplets of aqueous solutions that can contain biomaterials and cells, whatever. So in this case, we uh, if we deposit this kind of droplets, they will generate spherical droplets that upon solidification that can be done by cross-linking. So we can form micro gels uh, with different sizes, depending on the volume of the droplets that we are depositing. We can incorporate cells inside. And so the concept is that we can generate a spherical object without having any liquid outside, which is usually the way we are preparing microspheres using emulsion or other kinds of techniques that usually needs to have two liquid phases uh, to, to process these kind of shapes. In this case, we have basically air surrounding the object, so we can encap encapsulate drugs that will have what we call in, in more in the pharmacy side, 100% uh, of encapsulation of efficiency, because all the materials that will uh, put, that, that will be contained in the initial droplets will stay in the final, um, in the final microgels. We can incorporate very expensive proteins, we can incorporate cells, and the cells will kept alive because all the process can be done in very mild conditions, okay? So we can also incorporate other objects like magnetic microparticles if you want to control the mo motion of the, of the objects. And we can also play with, the, with other uh, modifications. For example, we can modify droplets of uh, an hydrogel precursor with uh, the powder, in this case, this, super, this hydrophobic powder that will sustain the spherical shape of our initial droplet is in fact a, a silica-based biomaterial, nanoparticle, which contain calcium and phosphorus. And so we can decorate the surface of the droplets with these uh, nanoparticles. Then we can irradiate with light, we can cross-link our, uh, our droplet because it contains metacrylated gelatin, so gelatin with double bonds that with light and the photo initiator can generate a stable um, hydrogel. So we can have an hydrogel that will be completely surrounded by this hydrophobic powder that was designed to have particular properties, which is bioactivity. Bioactivity in the orthopedic uh, point of view. So when in contact with bone or a physiological fluid similar to, to the one that we have in the, in the human, uh, in, the, in, in blood plasma, they will induce the precipitation of hydroxyapatite. So this is very important if we want to integrate these microgels to, for example, bone tissue. So in order to have a tight connection between the material and the tissue, we are going to see the generation of an apatite layer in the, at the interface that will enable a good integration. So we can check this ability for apatite deposition in vitro. So if we, if we uh, immerse these, uh, these beads in the simulated fluid, uh, we have the, the formation of an apatite layer, and this will increase the thickness of an apatite layer with, with, uh, with the immersion time. So we have uh, an increase in, in, uh, in the apatite layer from zero, one, seven, three or seven days. So this is really important if we want to use, for example, to, uh, to, uh, to regenerate bone tissues to have this kind of beads that could be implanted into the defects and the surface is engineering in order to interact very tightly with the surrounding bone. So this is a, a possibility of using so this super hydrophobic, not as an implantable material, but as a platform to process and to fabricate other kinds of materials. So the second example is also bio-inspired and is related with adhesion. So we are in our, our group is, into, is involved in a very nice consortium of cost actions related with bioadhesive materials inspired by nature. And of course, you can 
realize that there are many, many examples of sticky materials, organisms that can have permanent or non-permanent adhesion to surfaces. And a very nice example is, of course, muscles. Muscles can attach virtually to any kind of substrates, even Teflon or very uh, surface with very low surface energy. So that's why people have been trying to understand why, what is the reason why these filaments that are secreted by muscles can adhere to this kind of to any kind of surface. And of course, people from more from the biochemistry side, they analyze the, the composition of the proteins that are produced by the, by the muscles that, that allows it, the, these organisms to attach to rocks. And of course, they can sustain uh, very strong forces from waves and from currents in the ocean. And this is uh, because, uh, this, this is a conclusion, that the proteins that are attaching the, the, these filaments to the, to the substrate is very rich in the, a very strange amino acid, which is this dopamine, that contains these catechol groups. In fact, this is not a normal um, uh, amino acid. The amino acid is, is tyrosine that then, that then is modified by, to this kind of uh, uh, dopamine uh, um, uh, amino acid that contains the catechol groups that are very well known to attach virtually to any kind of substrates, okay, to, uh, due to different types of mechanisms of adhesion. And so uh, what people have been trying to, to use based on this kind of observation is either to engineering proteins, and we can do that uh, genetically by genetic engineer, to produce proteins that contains this kind of amino acid. So this is one possibility. And another one, which is a more reductionist kind of approach and that we have been uh, used in our lab is to modify materials that we are usually working in our lab uh, with this kind of catechol groups. Okay, so one possibility is to try to take natural based polymers like polysaccharides, proteins that exhibit reactive groups like carboxylic groups, amine groups, hydroxyl groups, um, sulfated groups, and try to uh, uh, introduce this kind of catechol groups uh, that we see in this kind of uh, muscle example. So in our lab, for example, we took a, a polysaccharide, a polyonic polysaccharide, in this case, hyaluronic acid, and using uh, um, EDCNAH uh, chemistry, using dopamine, we modify the carboxylic groups using these molecules in order to decorate along the chain the, the polymer with these catechol groups. Still, we still have, in the end, uh, a negatively charged polysaccharide that, for example, can be combined with a positively, char a po positively charged uh, polymer in order to produce objects. And for that, we have been working a lot with um, with a, a special technology, which is a layer by layer methodology. It's a it's very well known method to uh, modify surfaces by intercalating polymers with complementary interactions. In this case, we are playing with electrostatic interactions to intercalate polymers. So we are intercalating polycations and polyanions. So the, the technology is quite simple. We start with the substrate. And then we alternate using a solutions containing a polycation and the solutions containing a polyanion by sequentially immersing our substrates in these two solutions by intermediate washing them. What we are doing is to each, each, each dipping process, we are adding a new layer of our polymer. And at the same time, we are reverting the charge. So when we go for the oppositely charged solution, we, are, we can, uh, we can uh, absorb another uh, layer and we can do that cyclically in order to have multi layers over the substrate with the number of layers that we wish and therefore we can control the thickness of the coating. Okay, so we have been working with this kind of uh, technologies. We can use different types of building blocks to uh, absorb during the multi-layered processing, linear, branch, copolymers. We can even introduce um, objects like particles, nanoparticles, uh, and also even uh, living components like cells or microorganisms. So we can 
use them as a, a, a one of the components of the layer by layer process. So most of the people that are using this technology is to coat materials, okay, as a, 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 a to decorate to to modify the surface um, using this kind of uh, polymers. Uh, in our group, we are working a lot on trying to use this technology to prepare objects like freestanding membranes, capsules, tubular structures, so three-dimensional devices that can be used in different biomedical applications, okay? So for that, as an example, we can generate membranes by doing the layer by layer over a surface like polypropylene, which is a low surface energy. So after the multi-layers, we can detach the film that is purely composed by multi-layers of different types of polymers. In this case, we use chitosan and uh, I think uh, uh, chondroitin sulfate or alginate, which are, uh, the first one is a polycation, the others are polyamines. So we can generate multi-layers, films that are just composed by multi-layers, and then we can do some other modifications like cross-linking in order to control the mechanical properties. Okay, so in, in, in the work that we use, uh, so instead of having, for example, chitosan and the polyamine, we used chitosan and uh, our uh, hyaluronic acid modified with dopamine, okay? So we could generate coatings, uh, for example, over a glass slide, that if we have that uh, that have quite good adhesive properties similarly like what we see in, the, in terms of muscle attaching to the rocks so if we have just a, a normal film of chitosan and hyaluronic acid we have a load of detachment between two glass slides of about say 150 but when if we introduce some dopamine in our uh, um, hyaluronic acid our multi-layers get much more sticky, much more adhesive properties. And this could be very advantage for many applications in medicine where adhesiveness is very important, such as a, a surgical membranes uh, that, that, that can, can be very interesting for some applications. So we have so uh, these multi-layers that are much more sticky, much more adhesive. Uh, both physically, so in terms of macroscopic adhes uh, adhesiveness, but also in terms of biological adhesiveness. So we, we could see that when we seed cells over these slides, we could see much more cells and much more uh, spreading of the cells when we have, uh, when the, these cells are cultured over the multi-layers containing the hyaluronic acid modified with dopamine, as compared with normal multi-layers just containing chitosan and hyaluronic acid, okay? So moreover, again, we can use this kind of multi-layers as membranes, as I, I, I told you before. And again, these membranes are much more adhesive when we have dopamine in, uh, modified hyaluronic acid as compared with the membranes just containing chitosan and hyaluronic acid. So you can see here they, they are stratified. Again, over the membranes, not coatings, membranes, the cells adhere much better to the systems containing dopamine. And also we could see much better adhesion in, uh, in biological uh, tissues, like in bone. So you can see in here that this membrane containing dopamine is much more uh, ad adhered to the substrate as compared with, uh, with, uh, with uh, any membrane just containing chitosan and hyaluronic acid. So this could be used as a sealant in this case for bone after putting ceramics or a, a tissue engineering construct in the bone defect and then we could just close this uh, defect with, with this kind of membranes. So uh, moreover we can also think on using this kind of adhesive multilayers for dermal applications, for example for wound dressing and we could see again, in this case, we, we use the membranes of chitosan, alginate and hyaluronic acid with and or without dopamine. And we could see again that bio, in terms of bio, uh, metabolic activity and cellular activity, the, the, the later uh, membrane is, is, is performed much better. And uh, we went also for in vivo tests, okay? In this case, we uh, uh, skin injuries were induced in, in rats 
and I'm not going into detail, okay, but uh, generally we could see, we could see that um, the, the wound treated with the membranes that contains the dopamine, besides being more adhesive, they could accelerate, especially for long terms, we could see a much better regeneration of the skin under, uh, underneath the membrane when we have the membranes containing dopamine. Okay, so this was a, also an, an interesting result in terms not only of adhesiveness, but also uh, a biological outcome seen in vivo in the Wister rat model. So finally, I would like to show you um, a final examples on how using bio inspiration in this field of, in this case, we want to uh, to enter a little bit on, on drug released systems. So this is a very hot topic in biomaterials. Usually when you have a biomaterial that, uh, and, and we wish that these biomaterials can release in the controlled way drugs. So usually we impregnate the, the, the biomaterials with this drug and then we wait that from diffusion or for other kinds of, of or, uh, under uh, other actions, they will release in the controlled way or uh, or in the uh, systematic way, in the controlled way in terms of the kinetics profile, uh, our our drug of interest. So, uh, but we we got another idea on, on how to integrate the drug and the biomaterial, and this was inspired really by the an observation that we made, and this was really the first time that uh, anybody has this. Uh, this idea by direct observation. Um, so this is, was a discussion with the students where we were trying to develop ways to process microparticles similar to pollen uh, microparticles, okay? And we look some, on some picture and we realized that one of the way that bees interact uh, pollen particles is by putting them physically entrapped between these airs that they have in the legs and the abdomen. And you can see very clear in this picture, the pollen particles are tightly fixed between the airs of, of the bee. And this allows the bee to transport the pollen from one leaf, uh, one flower to the other. And even by flying, because it, those are fixed, quite uh, tightly fixed, between the airs, they can they can be stable. So what we uh, uh, observe, and you can also observe that, is that the dimension of the pollen particles are quite similar to the distance between the the airs. Okay, so we we uh, try to use this observation to try to develop some kind of a, a template or a substrate where we could fix particles, okay? Particles that could be drug particles or particles containing drugs inside, okay? So the concept was the following. So we have a membrane that is decorated or that is patterned with these, uh, with these uh, pillars, okay? These pillars should have similar distance of the particles that we want to entrap. Because if the particles are too small, they will not be fixed by the pillars, okay? So they could be loose very easily. And if the particles are too big, they will block the entrance of other particles. So uh, we believe that the most efficient uh, uh, solution would be when you have the pillars distance similar to the, to the size of the, of the particles. Moreover, we, uh, we hypothesize that if we have longer airs, um, we could accommodate more particles. And of course, the elastic properties of the airs should be also taken into account. So our deal was to generate a, a, a substrates with these pillars um, that was pr produced by, micro by, by soft lithography. In this case, we use the PDMS. And the idea is that just by putting in contact these substrates, we could accommodate and fix very easily and very fast the microparticles. So our idea is to have this kind of membranes that has these airs. And if we put in contact with the powder, the powder that contains the microparticles with the specific size that we want, they will fix very easily just by gentle contact, physical contact, um, the, the, the powder that we want. So the idea is that we could have this on the shelf 
and then we could put uh, any type of drugs or combination of drugs that we can have in our again in our shelf and very fast we could generate a membrane that contains uh, physically entrapped the particles that we want so we we went for the, some validation I, I will go very fast this was published uh, last year um, uh, and you can look at the paper in, in more detail what we what we realize is that uh, we validated basically the hypothesis so if we have for example particles with 80 micrometers of diameter we look on the as on the on the, how the particles are accommodated in in the substrates with pillars with different distance between the pillars 40 micrometers 80 micrometers and 160 micrometers so if we have a distance between the pillars which are 40 micrometers, we could see huge uh, deflection of the pillars and the number of particles could not be very high because they were blocking the entrance of other particles. Uh, uh, on the other side, if we have particle uh, pillars with distance that are much bigger than the particles, for example, 160 degrees, we could have a lot of particles surrounding, a little bit surrounding the pillars, but with a lot of empty spaces. So the best solution were when was where we have a good match between the distance between the pillars and the size of the microparticles. So we could check that. For example, in this, uh, in this graphic, you can see more, more black or more dark colors. It means that you have more particles. And here you have micro pillar spacing that goes from 40, 80, 160, and micro particles diameters, 40, 180, uh, uh, and 160. And you can see that is when you have the best match between the, 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 two, the, the two sizes, you have more particles. And especially when you have longer uh, airs, okay? Bigger, uh, bigger uh, 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 pillars, okay? Because in here we st study 100 and in here we have 300 micrometers. So again, I, I, we believe that the, the idea was validated by these experiments. We went for a, just a very quick uh, example of application and in this case, we used uh, alginate microparticles containing an uh, antimicrobial uh, drug. Okay, so, and uh, these particles has around 80 micrometers. They could accommodate between the pillars of our substrates. And then we did uh, antimicrobial tests of our membranes um, with different controls. Okay, just alginate particles. Uh, free patch, the patch without any microparticles, or with the alginate but without the drag, and of course the, the, our solution which is the patch, including the alginate microparticles that contain tetracycline. And we could, could observe that of course our pattern, our membranes containing the microparticles could have a very efficient uh, uh, release of the antimicrobial uh, drug and we could see the inhibition of the of the growth of bacteria using these simple tests and we we could validate the use of these membranes in this case as as antimicrobial membranes okay so I, I hope that I could show you that through three examples we could use nature as inspiration in order to think on new concepts that could be used for biomedical applications processing materials, either particles, membranes, and also materials with other functional properties like efficient adhesive properties, and that could be used in mild conditions, okay? Because in, we are thinking on glues or other applications, uh, these systems should be very non-cytotoxic. And it, with nature, we can learn a lot on that, okay? So finally, of course, I would like to thank the collaborators that we have in, our, in Portugal, in our university and, on, and especially around the world, the fundings, including the, the, the fundings from the European Commission. Of course, I always like to thank the group and the people that we have working in our group in, uh, in Aveiro at CISECO. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Joan. Uh, really uh, super interesting uh, talk, uh, a variety of uh, amazing examples of uh, interplay between science and this uh, nature. Um, so uh, we have time so, for some uh, questions. I have actually one here online. Uh, and the question is this, uh, uh, this was posed by Carlos Silva. Joan, do you think it would be feasible to use LBL processes at the industrial scale for continuous functionalization of surfaces? Okay, so very, very interesting question. In fact, there are already some attempts to, to use, uh, uh, the, to scale up the technology for industrial application, uh, especially for, for example, for paper modification. So you can think on, uh, or of, of big uh, rolls of papers that can go inside one bath and then to go another bath in the continuous way, okay? So this could be a way to modify uh, continuous films that could be paper or other kind of, of materials using this LBL. So this has been already done. Also uh, in the more, uh, I'm not sure in the, maybe in the uh, automobile industry, there are already very big tanks where you can do this kind of dipping process. And also there are other ways to, to deposit uh, different materials. That is, for example, by spraying. Instead of dipping, you just spray solution A, then you wash, and then solution B. And it has been shown that in terms of uh, industrialization of the technique is more efficient in terms of quantity of materials. And, and also on the adsorption efficiency. So the, there is already some attempts in industrializing the technology, yes. Thank you. I, I might have a, another question which is uh, related with uh, adhesive surfaces. Um, and uh, I mean, it's absolutely amazing, uh, particularly thinking about the uh, strength of, of the ocean. So I was wondering if uh, uh, these bonds are uh, are covalent bonds uh, that the, the, the muscles uh, or, uh, or the kind of material you are uh, developing, they create the covalent bonds or other type of bonds? Um, okay, good. <laughs> so they are covalent bonds, but you can also have the combination of covalent bonds with coordination bonds. Because, for example, it was shown that iron that coordinates with uh, catechol groups can also have a, a huge influence. So, but usually they are strong bonds and when the muscle attached to a rock, it will stay for the rest of his life, okay? So this is permanent adhesiveness and also it works, it's, and it works under saline sol solutions. So it's also adequate for medical applications because our physiological fluids also are quite similar to, to these conditions. And that's why we, we were trying to transpose what's happening in oceans also in the, in our, in the human body conditions. So so in case of the materials you're developing, you are also trying to achieve that, to uh, create these uh, covalent bonds with the surfaces. Yeah, yeah. So the, the cat call groups are very strong and attach quite easily to any kind of substrates through covalent bonds or, or coordination. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm wondering if there is uh, any other question. Um, I don't see. I, I might have actually one more, uh, which is uh, when you talk about the, the pillars and the, the particles, you gave the example of the bee. I was wondering about this um, uh, interplay of the, the mechanical properties of the pillars and the mechanical properties of the, the particles. Mm -hmm. So uh, is there uh, some sort of um, a range or, uh, or relationship between those? Because I, I am imagining these pillars have to, uh, have to have some kind of flexibility. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, Very good question. So we didn't analyze the influence of the mechanical properties of the particles. So we used very stiff particles of poly, uh, polyester, like polycaprolacton. So, but we analyzed the influence of the stiffness of the pillars. So we could generate pillars with different Young modules. And what we, uh, what we observe is that if we have very stiff pillars, it's a little bit difficult for the particles to accommodate because they should open a little bit so that the particles could go inside. If they are too soft, they physically will not be very effective in fixing the particles. So we, we analyze what, what would be not the optimal, but we, we show that there is a, a, 
a, a better outcome in terms of fixation in some intermediate values of, of stiffness. And so we analyzed that and we reported. And you are absolutely right. Right. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I'm just thank wondering you. if there is any other questions. Uh, if not, uh, is, is a bit time to wrap up. Uh, so kind of uh, on, uh, on the behalf of uh, the UT Austin Portugal program and also on behalf of the organizers, uh, Professor Brian Corgill at UT Austin and then uh, uh, Carlos Silva also at the um, at CTEP uh, um, and myself. Um, so I would like to thank, of course, the, uh, the speakers. Uh, this was a, an excellent uh, series of speakers uh, talking about very broad uh, uh, themes. Uh, just uh, as curiosity, I, I just look at uh, the meaning of biom biomimetic and uh, actually the definition is the emulation of model systems uh, elements of nature for the purpose of solving complex human problems. Um, of course, we are uh, interested in materials in general, and we have a very good, um, uh, very good examples uh, throughout uh, this afternoon, uh, starting with Keith, uh, which uh, uh, talk about bacterial extracellular electron transfer with the uh, applications in uh, biogeochemistry, bioelectronics, human health, uh, then uh, followed by Adrian uh, Rosales, uh, that uh, trying to mimic uh, biological structures. Um, and then uh, uh, we had uh, Martin, uh, which talked about light harvesting and manipulating uh, light using algae. Uh, he gave uh, uh, some interesting examples. And finally, uh, uh, Professor Jomano, that uh, talked about several things from hydrophobic uh, surfaces to adhesive surfaces as well as this interplay uh, uh, between pillars and particles. So this was actually a very interesting afternoon. I've learned myself quite a bit. Um, I don't know, Brian, if you want to say a couple of words also. Um, I uh, really appreciate uh, the participation of everyone and then of course the speakers. Yeah, I, I don't have much more to add to that. Just thanks again for everyone for joining and the speakers for giving really great talks. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. All right, so I think we are we are set for today. Uh, hope to see you uh, in the future. Bye bye.